Good morning, beloved. Monday morning. It's nice to be back. Woke up to a very chilly, was it 22 degrees this morning? My friend Brian, he, my my main riding partner, he uh, missed out on the season last year because he got he's got an old XR250 Honda. Uh, and we were uh, doing a service on it last year. We stripped out the spark plug and, uh, well, it got all taken apart and you know how those things happen. But he got it back, so it was our first ride together yesterday. And goodness, was it cold. We were glad to be back home after about four hours of the cold. Uh, but um, looking forward to that. I, hey, I just, I didn't know what was going on, but I was just made aware uh, by Mr. Overton uh, about the, um, the shooting, the school shooting that just, just took place. I, real, I found out about that about five minutes before 10 minutes before we were going to start here, and I jumped on and, and looked into it a little bit. And I thought maybe we would discuss that a little bit. I'm afraid to say we can expect more of these things to happen. What really surprised me uh, was that it was done by a female, uh, or that's what the story is being told uh, like this. That's the first time I can remember that happening. Um, and it would be very interesting to find out you know, what the motivation is and what was, what was behind that. This is especially, uh, especially a horrific thing because of the, of course, the children being involved. From what I read, the first early reports are that there were three children killed and three adults, and that this person came in uh, with multiple firearms. They said two assault rifles and two er, and a pistol. Now the, the facts of these stories seem to always change uh, as we get into them, um, and that's just what's being reported right now. Uh, what was also kind of interesting about this is that uh, they're claiming that this was a, a Christian school, so I'm assuming it was a private school. And usually when you have someone, uh, you know, as far, we have a lot of friends that have children in Christian schools, and they're, it, it is kind of the, uh, um, the in-between, if you're not able or not willing to homeschool, then a better option than a state indoctrination center uh, which is the public school system, would be a private Christian schools. And usually when parents decide to do that, um, they have, um, I mean, they're very, cer certainly very active in, in their kids' education because they have to pay for it. That's one of the great crimes of, um, of our tax system in this country, that those of us who decide to elect out of the public indoctrination institutes, which are the public schools, uh, we still have to fund them and pay taxes. And it's incredibly insulting uh, to a man of faith uh, to know that my money that I work hard for goes to the promoting of things that go against um, our core beliefs and against the teachings of the good book. Um, we don't need to go into details. We all know what we're talking about. So it's a double insult. So I have to pay for that as well as pay for educating my own children at home. There would be it would be nice to be an exemption. It just goes to prove, you know, I'm, I'm not, don't mean to capitalize on a, on a tragedy, but just to drive the point home, I've been t saying it for years. I mean, you, if you're going to decide to have children and to raise them up in this world, you have an obligation. It's your job and your responsibility to educate them. It's just because we've always done something for so long. You know, I went to public school, you went to public school, your parents went to public school. I, I get all of that. You can get into the mindset that that's just the only way that the, what, that's just the only option. That's the only thing that we have to, to do. But that's not the way it was done until about the last hundred years or so. In the past, it was left up to parents and families to educate their own children. And now that we have the continued threat, the constant threat of um, school shooting, and the more profile and the more coverage that, that it gets, the more we can expect to see copycat sort of things. They think that they're going to, the powers that be, think that they're going to curtail this, so they're going to fix this by banning firearms or uh, trying to rein in the freedoms that we have through the Second Amendment. It's si very similar to Western medicine uh, in that... Um, Instead of looking at what is causing, what is causing someone to be obese, instead of looking at that, uh, the solution is, well, let's just cut out a bunch of their intestine. Let's staple their, their stomach uh, so it's only a fourth the size of it is normally. I mean, when you think about that logically, is that really a solution? Now, I'm not a doctor, but you don't have to be a doctor to have some common sense. And... Looking at the guns, uh, the tools that are used in these things, it, that's it, and preventing them, that is not where it's coming from. Where it's coming from is there's a family problem, the breakdown of the family. Single mothers, 
if you want to look at a very interesting statistic, look at the percentage of men that are, in, that are incarcerated in state and federal prisons. Look at the percentage that came out of single family homes, uh, mother w being raised only by mothers without a father in the home, uh, and you'll be staggered. We don't have to be geniuses to figure out that that's a problem. And now we have had a couple generations um, of boys and men raised by women and feminists um, that are out there in the wild, and we can expect to see more of these problems and the, and these these type of school shootings. So what do we do? What does Proho do if he has little kids in these institutes? You need to take them out, beloved. And I mean, if the chance of this happening, if you look at all across the country, you know, there are a lot of schools, there are a lot of kids in school today, and it's unlikely that this is going to happen. Is it impossible? It's not. So there is a small threat there, but the bigger threat, the bigger threat is what they're teaching them. They're turning your children against you. They're teaching them behind your back values that are not in line with your values. And let's just call it for what it is. Because of convenience, it's, uh, there's a lot of things. I don't, I mean, I, I don't want to sit up here and cast stones. I don't know everyone's situation. And there are some situations, some families that I know, both families have to work uh, in most cases. Everything has gotten so expensive. Housing has gotten so expensive. Both families have to work to maintain the lifestyle that we've come to expect, what's, what the ordinary American, standard American lifestyle. I get that. And the idea of removing half of that, i.e. having your wife stay home and raise your kids, educate your kids, homeschool your kids, when you look at the math, it's just impossible. But it comes down to decisions for a lot of people, not all. Now, don't email me with your, you have a, a situation that's impossible or more difficult than the rest of us, and you, have to, you do what you have to do. I'm, I'm, I understand that. But there are a lot of you, if you're really going to be honest about it, and take a hard look at it, that you would have the ability to pull your kids out of these, these government indoctrination schools um, and educate them yourself. What are the obstacles? The first one I always hear, well, I, I'm not a teacher. I wasn't particularly academic. I'm not qualified to do this. You know, maybe you didn't even graduate high school. Who am I to teach my children? That's not an excuse. There are so many men and women, there are so many families doing that, and there's such a good group uh, providing resources that you can get the curriculums. There's, mo there's multiple, mul multiple curriculums. And all you have to do is you have to, d everything's there for you. You have the teacher's manual. You have the curriculum. You have the testing. You have the benchmarks. You just have to be a week ahead of your kids, really. It just, it just is a matter, it's just a decision to do it. The other thing is, well, you know, we, we can't afford to do it. We can't afford to give up that income. Well, maybe some of you can't, but many, many of you can, but you're going to have to make some hard decisions. You're going to have to sell the extra car. You might have to go down to one car. You might have to sell the home where you live, and you might have to move to a place that's more affordable. It's about decisions. And I'll tell you, beloved, this is the truth. We will give an account, especially us fathers. We will give an account someday when we stand at the pearly gates when God asks us, what about those little ones that I gave to you? What did you do with them? Did you raise them properly? Did you take responsibility for them? Or did you ship them off into a, did you throw them to, the, to, to a den of wolves in the public school system out of convenience because you wanted to maintain a particular lifestyle? I understand. We cut our income when we decided for Mrs. W to, when, when, when she got pregnant with Jack, when we decided for, that we, we didn't want to, we wanted to, to raise our own kids, educate our own kids, we made the decision for her to be a stay-at-home mom, and we walked away from a six-figure income. I understand it. I get it. Trust me. I understand the sacrifice. And I also understand the burden that when she left that job and those paychecks no longer came in, I understand the burden that rested squarely upon my shoulders and the responsibility that now was all upon me to provide for this little family that we'd started. And I understand that. I know how scary it is. I understand it. Trust me. I've been there. But one thing, the one factor that you're not looking into, you can look at the numbers, 
you can look at the time, you can look at the job you have that you don't think you'll be able to replace in a remote location. One thing you're not factoring in is the power of the Almighty. The power of the Almighty, the Almighty has the ability to make these things happen for you. What he's asking for you is a small step of faith to move forward. That's what faith is. Faith is, it could be a small thing or it could be a large thing. It could be a large thing giving up half of your income because you want to do the right thing and you want to get your kids out of these indoctrination centers. The school shootings are one thing, but that's really, there's probably a higher probability of your child being in, in, injured in a car accident if everything was really, if the truth was known. Not that it's not important or that it, it doesn't affect people, it does. But the bigger problem is what are they teaching them? What are they, learn, what are they learning? If you want to see something that will, will shake you to the bone, to the core, if you have girls, go online and look up pictures of girls before and after they went to liberal colleges. Go look at the pictures. There's a whole bunch of them out there. You'll see, see girls at 17, 18, pretty, conservative, you know, just coming from good families, and at the end of a three or four year stint in these liberal colleges, they come out with pink and purple hair, septum piercings, tattoos on their face, 200, 300 body count, absolutely have destroyed themselves, wrecked themselves, thrown them to the wolves. For what? For higher education? I mean, you can't recover for something like that. And who is going to be held accountable in the day of judgment for the families that, that have thrown their, their daughters and son, sons into these environments? You know, I'm not God, I'm not anyone to judge, but I'm telling you it's something we should take a hard look at. So it's sad. It's a sad deal. Sad deal. If you have no choice, there are going to be situations. You, I don't need to hear about it, I'm sure. I mean, you, you can cope and make excuses all, of you, all you want. There's always going to be excuse. There's always going to be, be a reason why your situation is more difficult than everyone else's. But rarely is that going to be the honest case if you were to look yourself in the mirror and, and really uh, make a hard decision when it comes to that. Don't, you don't have to tell me. I'm surrounded by families that don't make a lot of money that have taken on the responsibility of educating their five, six, seven children on small, very small incomes with a stay-at-home mom. They're making sacrifices. They don't eat out. They have one car. They find their entertainment other ways. You know, they, they cut coupons. They do what they have to do. And they also, the ones that are the most successful, they also partner with the Almighty. And the Almighty will compensate and provide in ways that you, when you just don't see it's possible. If you don't think it's possible, go forward and do it. Do it. And get dead on your knees and ask God to help you. He knows what you have needed before you ask. For the rare, situ for the, for the rare individuals that really are, or just are unwilling to do it or just don't have the faith to go move forward and educate their own kids and keep them in these environments, like I said last week, you know, there are some options. Would a child's book bag in Tennessee today with armor plates, would that have made a difference? Would you, have liked, would you like to go into a situation when so, where someone was shooting at you with this or without it? What would you prefer? So I would, if I found myself, if I had children in an urban, situ, urban schools and I, had, you know, I just wasn't willing or able to, to homeschool, whatever the what excuse is, I would look at this. And now that you've seen it, now you have an obligation. So it's out there. Um, just consider... Very interesting that we brought this up last week, and here we are faced with another, yeah, another tragedy like this. And yet, who will be the enemy? What's going to be the enemy? Law-abiding, good folks of America, pro-Second Amendment, responsible gun owners. We will be the ones um, that all of this anger and frustration, all of it will fall upon us. Um, it's unfair, but that's the way that it is. They don't have the ability or they don't have the desire to look at the root core because they're responsible for it. Oh, goodness, the mountain water. Well, rant, my rant is, it is over. Let's jump into our super chats here. Goodness. We have a super chat from 
our new member from Lumberjack. Welcome, Lumberjack. Good to have you here. I have, uh, I have a new video for you members in the can uh, that I will be uploading today. Uh, someone asked me if I could share my number, my four favorite carry holsters. Now, I've been concealed carrying uh, for a long time. I think I got my concealed carry, my first one, when I was 21. 21, and I've been carrying ever since. So I, I have a lot of experience with a lot of different holsters. Uh, so I, I thought about it. If I could only have four that would cover every situation, deep concealed carry, maybe a little bit less concealed, winter carry, and then full on overt, where are you strapping on, strapping on a battle belt and uh, that sort of thing. I chose my four favorite and I did a comprehensive video for you guys that I'll put up there. So that'll be for members. So just as a thank you to you guys. Goodness, we have a super chat from McFadden, who's been with us for two months. Two months down, can't wait for dual alternators. Yeah, so I haven't looked. I've been, boy, goodness, the weekend was crazy. Uh, members are supposed to, I'll, I'll get with the middlemen. Uh, members are supposed to be picking uh, the new emoji uh, we just unlocked. We're at nine, we just went over 900 members, a little bit over that, and we unlocked a new member emoji that you guys will have access to. So you still have time, put your vote in the comment section. The middlemen will be monitoring those, take a look at it, and we will we'll get that, I'll get that put together for you. Shout out to McFadden, and thanks for being with us. Mr. Kyle B is in the house. Welcome, Mr. Kyle B. He says, looks, that looks like one comfortable cat. Mama, are you just chilling back there? Are you just chilling? <laughs> the sweet loaf, the sweet loaf comes out here. She spends a lot of time with me out in the shop. She's, uh, she's turning out to be a bit of a, uh, of a tomboy, uh, and she loves the shop, but there's a bit of a love-hate uh, relationship with the cat. Now, I don't know, I, I have not been a cat owner. This is the only cat I've had. This cat and I have been in, I think, no less than four or five shops together. She's uh, 18 years old, the best I can tell, maybe 19. And she, in all that time we've been together, she, I would not consider her to be a tame animal. As what was it, C.S. Lewis, how did he state it? Aslan is not a tame lion. You know, she, she definitely is not a, not a tame cat. I'm the only one that can actually pick her up. Um, I can actually flip her upside down. We have trust. Uh, but when the sweet loaf comes out and tries to do these things, well, usually someone leaves a, a, a little bit bloody, and that is certainly not the cat. <laughs> but even so, she keeps coming back for it. So I warned her. I said, she is. this is not a tame cat. Don't be bothering her. I told her, this is how you pet Mama Kitty. She does it. Oh, she only has it, will allow it to be done a certain way, and yet the sweet loaf does not seem to learn her lesson. So, yeah, that's how you learn, man. That's why I keep Band-Aids on hand. But I... She is a good cat. I don't know how much long, I don't know how long a cat can live. I'm, I'm at, at this point, she's so old now, at coming up on 20 years old, that I'm, I'm always a little bit surprised that she's still here in the morning. What does a cat do when it dies? Does it go off somewhere or does it just die in its box? I don't know. But I, Mama, don't bite me. Don't bite me. When, um, when she meets her end, when she uses up her nine lives, I think I'll replace her. I think I'll uh, maybe just get a kitten and um, have it out here because cats are very wonderful to have in a shop. Because out, I don't know about your situation, but out here there's a lot of mice. And when, the, when it gets cold, the mice tend to want to come in. And there's a heat source in here with the wood stove. So they're always coming in and sneaking under cracks. And, and she keeps it completely mouse-free in here. About every two weeks, one to two weeks or so, she leaves a little mouse carcass, a little surprise here for me. And so she earns her keep. I feed her, and she takes care of the mice problem. So we have a pretty good situation. We get along just fine. We have a super chat from Mr. Ethan Haymore. Ethan's been with us for two months. Shout out to you, Ethan, and welcome. Ethan says, what's a reasonable amount of time to date someone before you, you propose? How much time does it take to see someone's true colors? That's a very good question, Ethan. I'll tell you. I'll tell you my particular, I, I, just, I, I would say, I would say, and it's going to depend. Now, if you have, if you know someone, uh, like have known this, kn known this girl as a, as a young girl, maybe in your community or in school, and you have seen her character and you know a little bit about her, maybe you'll know a little bit about her family and such, even though you weren't dating, dating or courting, um, 
you know, that, that's important information, especially if you know her family. So I would say in a situation like that, you know, you could speed things up pretty significantly. You know, and I don't know that any more than, than a, maybe, you know, a, a couple months, you know, three months or so of, of courting or dating uh, wouldn't be sufficient, providing you know the background of the woman. You know, that, that's the key. Now, if you're, just, if you're just cold approach, like, and you know nothing about this woman other than just what she's told you, um, you don't know her family and are not likely to meet her family, you can't see how they live, you can't especially meet her father, um, I would be very, very cautious with this, and I would say no less than a year, and that would be the minimum. I would want to know some, some specific things. I would want to know, most importantly, what is the, her relationship with her father? If her relationship is good with her father and that she regularly communicates with her parents and such, that's a huge, huge benefit. That would put my mind to rest significantly. That would be a big one. If she does not know her father or is a strange or has, uh, says bad things about her father, now again, there's going to be exceptions. Maybe the dude was a bad dude, but I'm just, I don't care about individual situations or her. I'm concerned about you guys. I'm, I, w I want you to take care of yourself and make sure you make the best decision. So I'm sorry that these 304s have had bad situations were rang, ra raised by feminist mothers um, and probably, uh, and, and be cautious. You may find that, that a woman is talking bad about her father, saying, oh, he was no good, he was a deadbeat, but I'll tell you, brothers, nine times out of ten, her mother has poisoned her mind. And her mother so hated the father for whatever reason, right or wrong, that this is what women do. They will poison the minds of their children against the father uh, to destroy him. They're just vindictive and evil, many of them. So even though she says this, that may not be the case. I would want to talk to her father, if at all possible. That's very important, that relationship. So if she has negative things to say about her father or the father's absent or she doesn't know him, I would not get involved with a woman like that. I would not get involved. I know, I know how bad you want it. You think you may have found a unicorn. Not likely. Not likely. You've got to be smart about it. You've got to get a hold of your biology, beloved. You really do. There's nothing, you know, You've got to get a hold of your biology, and you've got to be thinking with your big head. This is an important decision. It's very important because if 10 years down the road goes, go look at the comments from, the pro, uh, from Proho that have been wrecked by divorce on that last video, the video I did on Friday about, um, about this topic. It was the last one or two videos that I did. Go look at those comments and go look at the men who spent 10, 12, 16 years battling through family court and it wrecked them physically, it wrecked them financially, it wrecked them emotionally. It, they never took away their ability to ever trust a woman again. Go read those stories if you want to be reminded of how dangerous these women can be to your lives in this culture. You can be 10 years in, everything perfectly fine, and all she, no, no fault divorce now, all she has to say is, I'm not happy anymore. She makes a false accusation against you she takes away your children, and then and she wrecks you financially. If you find yourself in a situation, if you're in your 50s, do you think you're going to recover from that? When she takes the home, she takes your, your money, she takes your retirement, are you going to be able to recover from this? Are you ever going to be able to trust another woman again after a betrayal like this? You have to make the right decision now. You have to give yourself every possible opportunity of success. No father. Red flag, that, 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 that's, that's gone. Feminist mother, red flag, not possible. So let's say she passes these tests, right? Is she on social media? Scour her social media, hire a company to do it. Hire a private investigator to dig into her past. Women will lie. They'll lie about their body count. They'll lie about their pasts. If she's moved around multiple cities, Oftentimes, they'll do that to escape a situation. They'll burn bridges. They'll, they'll be promiscuous. They'll, bur they'll destroy their reputation, and they'll hop around to try to get a fresh start, fresh start, fresh start. If you have someone that jumps around a lot and is moved around, that, uh, uh, that sort of thing, that's a big red flag. That's a, that, that could be a potential problem. 
So get that private investigator and look into her background. Where has she worked? What is she doing? Is she on social media? Is she posting sexy pictures of herself or scantily clad, clad pictures of herself on social media? She's not Tradcon. She's not, not something you want. If she's done that, she is a straight up 304. So avoid that. If she's got an OnlyFans, that's, 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 uh, that's a no-go right there. Tr a true, see, you're in a dangerous situation right now because there's a whole bunch of former 304s that are grifting right now because they understand being a 304 is not getting them what they want. It's too common now. And there's too much competition. And they're looking and they're starting to see, oh, there's a, there's, there's a Tradcon movement. Men are saying they want traditional women. Well, so now I'm going to uh, clean myself up and wipe off all of the uh, makeup and take out the hoop earrings, and, and uh, I'm going gonna re to be reborn a virtuous woman, even though I've been a slur in the past. They're going to fool a lot of men. They're going to button themselves up. They're going to have those tattoos removed, or they're going to hide them, or whatever they're going to do, and they're going to come off as a virtuous woman. But you need to dig into them. If they're, if they're professing to be virtuous women and traditional Tradcon women, you, the, the private investigator will find out. Will fi they'll find out because the Internet's forever. And so don't be fooled by that. A lot of, a lot of young men are going to be conned by these grifting women that are, posing, uh, that are passing themselves off as Tradcon uh, when they've been 10, 15 years uh, out in the streets. So... Just some, th some things to think about. I mean, this is just the cold, hard facts. Be logical about it and do your homework. But I would say no more than a year. Also, take her to do, put her in, uh, in situations that are stressful and see and watch how she reacts. How does she react when things are, when there's a little bit of pressure or difficulty put upon her? Is she someone that's willing to persevere and to, and to put her head down and, and to suck it up and to, to get through it? Or does she completely fall apart? Well, what could that be? That could be camping in an austere environment where it's a little bit cold uh, or difficult or a long hike. It doesn't have to be a military march, but something, you know, put a little pressure on her or a bike ride or something like that. But get her in as many situations as possible and watch how she behaves. Watch how she behaves, especially the true colors will start coming out at about the three month mark. She'll be start becoming, becoming familiar with you and think that she can kind of let her hair down a little bit. And that's when you start to see the real character. Also, how does she treat waiters and waitresses? Is she demanding is she difficult? Is she sending food back? Does she talk about people behind their backs? Does she have, uh, th does she gossip? Um, you know, that, that, those sort of things are, are, very, uh, are very important. You should be watching and looking. You're, you're interviewing her. Don't let her know what you're doing. I'm not, I don't mean to keep something from her, but this is a very important decision. And you want to see how she reacts in every possible situation. So... Not that they're not out there, but if I were you, I would get a passport and I would probably marry someone outside the country from a smaller country that of a, of a more of a traditional woman. Um, there's just, it's just going to be, it's going to be very, they're going to be very few and far in between. But if you're seeing these things, and especially if you have assets, if she meets all the criteria and uh, you think you found a unicorn, you propose that. And if she bridles against that, if she balks at that, then you're going to have your answer. If she's truly yours and is committed to you at the end of a year and you're a high value, high quality man, um, then she will not let that, that will not be an impediment. Will she like it? No, she's not going to like it, but I would demand it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't move forward without it. And if she decides to walk away, because of the prenup, well, you just dodged a major bullet, beloved. Hope that helps. Be careful out there, Ethan. And don't remember, remaining a bachelor is also a very viable option. And not to be, not, and you should consider that as well. We have a super chat from Mr. Air. You know, you can do, I mean, if you, if children, you know, the main thing is children. That's the big problem. That, that's what so many men, what, what they really, really want. Of course, we want to have a loving mate. 
and we want to have um, someone that we we can be intimate with and and to share our successes and joy, the joys of life and all of that but really a, a lot of men when it comes down to it want children remember that surrogacy you you can use it you can hide you can get a surrogate you know that that is an option for you and you're not going to run the risk of anyone taking your children from you from you go out make your fortune you know make your place in the world establish yourself you know and and understand that okay at I, I, at when i'm 30 or whenever when i've got my house you know what when i'm in a position financially where i can take care of this you can you know it's going to cost you 100 grand or if you go out of country you know maybe 50 60 but you can do surrogacy you can you can hire a woman and you can have children that way and there will be no th no risk of anyone taking them from you and you know you, you can also you know what what you would what you're going to pay for let, let's say you have a full-time nanny or a part-time nanny that comes in while you're at work let's say she comes in eight hours a day and she does meals for you and cleans the house and that sort of thing in the long run i i, I promise you take to help take care of your children through a surrogate then you will maintaining a high maintenance wife i i trust i mean i'll bet it's a fraction probably 10 percent I mean, it sounds, oh, nan nannies are expensive. No, you don't know. You don't know, man. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. So that's an option. You know, don't, for, don't, don't, um, don't overlook that. So if, if children is your goal, um, then that's an option as well. We have a super chat from Mr. Eric Bentley. And Eric's been with us for, for two months. Welcome, Eric. Eric says, hey, Cody, last Friday I asked for advice for a tour I was taking of an excavation business. As soon as I turn 18, I start the job. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations. I remember that, Eric. I, I asked Eric once he, he, Eric is a young man and was going to seek about a job for an ex, he wants to run an equipment excavating company. And he asked for advice uh, as to how he should conduct himself and how he should go about that to give himself the best chance of landing this job. And here we have the report back. So I'm assuming Mr. Bentley, that it went well. I'm assuming that uh, since they offered you the job, uh, that you made a good impression. I'm proud of you. Good job. Excellent. Shout out to Eric. Let's put sevens in the chat for Mr. Eric, a young man that went out and got it done and lined up a job. The job is waiting for him uh, when he gets out of school. That shows some incredible initiative, and I am very, very proud of you. Good job, man. Warms the soul. Warms the soul. Shout out to Eric. Great. Congratulations, brother. That's exciting. That's exciting. We have a new member. Uh, we appreciate how much effort you put on these videos. New member can. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you guys being here. You know, you pay for these things with your time, and that is a very, vol a very valuable commodity. That's something that we, that we only have a finite amount about, amount of. We have a super chat from Mr. Spant, Sp Spence Hayden. Shout out to you, Spence. Sorry about that. Spence says, my wife homeschools. I do auto body. A great career. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there you have it, right? Spence, Spence Hayden is getting it done. His wife is homeschooling. I don't know all their situation. But auto body, I, I'm gonna, going to assume that Spence has made, him and his wife have made sacrifices to make this happen. Auto body is a good job. I, I've always loved the auto industry. I, I, did, I was never like a professional guy, I'm sure, like you are, but I, I did do small stuff when I had my Jeep wrecking yard. You know, I, I painted, you know, painted bumper covers, and I paint fenders, and minor auto body, and you know, I, I, that sort of thing. I get it. That's not typically, you know, I mean, that's, that's not, guy's not making a quarter million dollars doing that typically. So I'm going to assume that you are a working class dude with a working class wage, and yet you have taken on the responsibility of educating your own children. I know you've made sacrifices. I know your wife has as well, because it, there's a, it takes a lot of effort that goes into that. But that, that's what loving parents do. They take on the responsibility of raising their children, and what Spence is doing, him and his wife, should be applauded, and I applaud it, and I'm proud of you as well, Spence, for doing that. Not everyone has the courage to do it, and I understand the sacrifice that's involved. Tell your wife that we're proud of her as well. Goodness, it makes me feel good. Makes me feel good. 
the good thing, the good thing about the decline uh, and the and the woke, woke coach culture and the stat, status of education and the schools in this country getting so bad and drag queen story hour, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As terrible as all, all these things are, this is ultimately a good thing because it, it is put a spotlight upon how corrupt and how horrible these institutions, these government institutions are. And really, this has been going on in the background for some time now, but it has not been out in the open. It has not seen the light of day, but now it's starting to be seen because of social media and, and, and just, they, they went too far. And parents are waking up to it. And this is causing an absolute explosion in homeschooling. Mrs. W is very involved with the homeschooling and has worked as a director. And, and it, she has such an incredible skill set that she's constantly being um, headhunted uh, to come and to, to, to take a more administrative role in helping to set up um, homeschool networks and such in, in the area. But she resists that because her priority, as much as that is very, is very flat, I, I know how flattering and how honor, honored she is that people come to her with this um, and that would trust her uh, to do this sort of thing. And I know that in her heart she would love, love to do it. Because one of the worst things about being a housewife is, is the lack of attaboys. You know, we all are human. We all like to be told um, that we're doing a good job. We all like to make a mark in this world. We, we, like, to, uh, we like to be around uh, other equals, peers, and, and um, receiving the accolations of a job well done and a pat on the back. You know, we get all that, right? You know, you take my, my example. So I, I, I'm out here publicly. And, you know, the supportive comments come in and, oh, you know, this is so great. And, and I wish, you know, you know, every, all, all of the, the, the constant feeding of, of the ego and the dopamine, right? Well, Mrs. W., she's not receiving any of that. You know, not that that's good. Maybe that's not even a good thing. You know, that only comes from the admiration of, of her, uh, her husband and her children. And she, you know, she, she realizes, of course, she could do this and she would be very good at it. But as she told me, I'm going to turn it down because my responsibility, my priority are, is first my husband and then my own children. I'm not going to sacrifice my time and attention to my very own children uh, to, to do another thing uh, or to help other people's kids. My, my, my priority is first with my husband and second with my children. And, you know, that's what a trad con woman does. And that's what you're looking for. You know, and I hold her in very high regard. And I esteem her immensely um, because she could pursue these job offers. And she could um, be very successful at it and receive all the accol accolades that go along with that. But she's willing to, she understands that she's willing to put her family before her own needs. And that's what separates Tradcon woman from all these 304s out here. You know, there's an co old comedy skit. I would encourage you to watch it. Um, who was, who was he, the comedian? He's died now. Patrice O'Neill. Patrice O'Neill. Patrice O'Neill uh, was ahead of his time. He saw uh, the problems of, of the breakdown of society and uh, the real problems with, with feminism and what it did. And he said something that was so interesting is that I don't know how I do this without offending people. Patrice was, is not family friendly, friendly, so just FYI there. He said that, uh, he asked a question of w women. If, if you were involved in a train wreck and uh, in some crazy situation or whatever, uh, your, um, how do I put this? Um, I'm trying to put, let's say that uh, your kid, the, the woman's uh, kitty was no longer usable, that she didn't have that uh, to offer uh, to her, her husband. Um, what would she have to bring? If, she, if that was not something that, that, that was no longer something that was on the table, what would she have to give to her husband if she didn't have that? And if he, when, when he uh, asked this question to the you know, large group of women, um, there wasn't, I don't think there was one in the house that had anything really to offer, that that was it. So if you take that away, 
if you if you look look at this, I know this is a little crass, but it, but but it was actually quite a, a brilliant point. As a, as as a young pro ho right now, like if you're looking at a potential mate, you'd ask yourself this question: If she didn't have that as an incentive, then what would she have? Is that the only thing? What I'm getting at is that the only thing that she has to offer? If she can't cook. If she's so selfish that she spends her time getting attention and dopamine on social media, if you know all, all of these red flags that I talked about, that do you think that she's going to make a good mother? Do you think she's going to put her children first? Do you think she's going to put you first? Yeah, that's the most important thing. So I thought that was a very insightful question that he asked. Very insightful. We have a super chat from the Sterling Power Project. Welcome, the Sterling Power Project. St Cody, look into red light viewing. It has been shown to slow down and reverse macular degeneration. Red light viewing. I will look into that. Yeah, can you send me, send me at, send me, Cody at Wranglerstar.com, send me an email uh, to maybe something that would get me on the right track with that. I don't know what that is. Um, but I'm open to oh, new knowledge. You know, we're in a time now where God is revealing a lot of truths that we have not known to be the case, uh, and, and that um, just putting glasses on all the time might not be the solution. So I'm always interested to chase these things down. If this is something that comes from the Almighty, uh, then we should uh, we should be open to new ideas, especially now as new truths are being revealed. So I I would like to I would look, like to look into that. Thank you. Send that over to me, Cody at Wranglerstar.com. Our good friend, Caddy Wampus. Welcome. Writes, picked up a Bofang radio under your recommendation, having a ton of fun learning how to use it. Hope none of those ham guys reported me to the FCC. Goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so I heard back from, I heard back from a, a bunch of ham guys uh, that, uh, after the comment. And the ham guys, they fall into two categories. Category number one, is the insufferable ham radio guy. Now, he is uh, all about following the rules, always a boomer, always a boomer. Um, and he writes me reams, reams of, of um, paragraphs on emails about um, uh, the rules and the reason for the rules and, and how, you know, uh, all... Uh, the disservice that I'm, uh, you know, you know the type, right? Where the, where you know it as soon as you see it, where you just can scan the first sentence and the last sentence where he's shaming you, and then you can just block him and delete it and go on. There's no reason to read all of that. I am certainly not going and reading through reams of paragraphs from a boomer. The second type is actually not insufferable and has some good points, and they say, I get it. I know exactly ham radio guy that you're talking about, and you're right. He is indeed insufferable. But then they go on to offer some, some, some advice uh, that, that is actually helpful. Um, it makes me rethink my stance. You know, I am, a, I am an indignant uh, child, uh, a petulant child, as I like to say. And, I, um, and once, once someone gets my goat, like ham radio did, has done, East Coast guy has done, Arborist guy has done, I just, all I can do is just see red. I, or cops. All I can do is see red, and I cannot be logical or objective. I just get in, in a passion, uh, and, and it, it, it is a great shortcoming of mine, but, but it's just the way that it is. But so insufferable is ham radio guy that he just, he makes my blood boil of, of his ignorance and foolishness. So I don't know what point I'm making other than ham radio guy is insufferable. But shout out to you, Caddy Wampus. Yeah, it is good. You know, $65, you can get your Bofang. This is the one you want, beloved. This is very limited marginal information from someone who knows nothing about what he's talking about other than just strictly a very a simpleton and an end user uh, that uh, uses them a lot. Um, the little Bofang, I have several models. This is my favorite. I've even got some nicer radios, you know, some USA-made radios, but I still prefer these because of the form factor and just the ease of use. You know, it's got a flashlight on it. My Motorola doesn't have a flashlight on it. 
So these are great. This is the, the one you want is the BF F8 HP. It's about $65 on Amazon, um, and uh, you get a great little radio. When you buy these, uh, get, um, get a pair if you can. So you have one to hand out. It doesn't do you any good just to have one if you don't have a network. If you don't have your own, if you're not building your own warband, where you are programming your radios and coming up with plans and contingency things, having one is not going to do you any good. Who are you going to talk to, right? So you need to have a pair and start using them. So if you go out with your buddy ice fishing, if 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 North North Man likes to go up ice fishing in his shanty, you know he can have this and talk to his friend. Uh, or you like to do moto? These are great for moto motorcycles. Just get the little. It's got a little. Get the little uh, Kenwood plug. Get a little Kenwood remote mic, like the cops have. Get a used one on eBay. Twenty bucks. Put this in your pack, and you can talk to each other. And, and they're they're wonderful. But buy this. Buy the programming cable. It's going to cost you an extra twenty bucks or so, and that'll be USB. You'll plug that into your computer. And then you're going to download a free software called Chirps, C-H-I-R-P-S. And Chirps is going to give you the ability to very simply add and subtract and program your radio from your computer. You know, yes, you can program this thing. You can go online and you can get the frequencies of your local law enforcement. If you want to listen to that, your local, um, uh, the trains, uh, if you want to listen to the, the paramedics, the fire departments, that's all good to have on there. Very important. You should have that on there for your local area. So you go online, get those frequencies, and yes, you can enter them in there, you know, push, 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 but it's, unless you're an engineer guy, you're not going to be happy doing that. It's very, very tedious. So the Chirps software will give the ability that you can kind of just copy and paste and search out these things and put them in there, and it'll just load them right into your radio. And then once you build your database, and you can, it's very simple. I did it. I did it, so I know you can do it. There's a bunch of videos on there. Stay away from Ham Radio Guy because he'll make a 50-minute video on how to do that. Look for the video of a guy showing you how to do it in 10 minutes. Don't watch the 50-minute video. You can do the same thing in 10 minutes. And then you can build that database and save it. And then when your buddy gets a radio, then you just plug it into your $20 cord, and you just move those files over, you immediately program it, and, and you're good. But you should all have a Bofang. Shout out to Caddy Wampus. Mr. Joe C., been with us for three years, an OG. Welcome, good to see you back. Mr. Joe C. says, I've been using the Bofang radios as well. They're extremely fun to learn with. I've been talking with ham radio. I've been talking, take... Public school rears its ugly head. I've been using the Bofang radios as well. They're extremely fun to learn with. I've been taking ham radio courses to learn more about the technical side. Do you think it's worth a license? Sorry, FCC. If you want to do it, that's fine. I'm not opposed to getting a license. Yes, I, it would be better to have a license. Uh, you're going to have a, you're going to be way ahead of me, a lot better knowledge of it and understand these things and, and be able to legally do it. Right. That's fine. I just, I just can't get with government regulation, man. I just am, am not, uh, I just am not down with taking tests. I took tests and suffered through all of that indoctrination and all of that nonsense in school. And I vowed when I got out of that hell hole, I was not going to take any more tests. So I've, I've constructed a life uh, where I don't have to write anything on paper or be a, held accountable to anyone or taking any tests. And so I bristle against it. So, but that's just my shortcoming. Um, yes, I only, I'm, I'm only interested in using this for just staying in contact with family and when we're on outings and stuff. It's just a tool I want to pick up and use. I, I got too many things going on. I'm pursuing too many other interests. That's not my thing. But if you are, you have that mindset. If you're more of that engineered style type of guy and, and you like to fiddle with that and you like certifications and stuff, that, then you should do that. Yeah, of course, absolutely. I, I don't want to poo-poo on it. I, I, it's just my, I just don't want to do it. It's just my personal thing. Shout out to Joe C for taking, taking on the, the responsibility of getting commu good communications. And it is, it is fun. I, I really enjoy these little radios. They really are. It's the $65 of enjoyment you get out of having these and using them is, um, 
is pretty extraordinary. They're just excellent little radios. I just, just love them. I look at that thing and it gives me, the, it still gives me the fizz. I sit it right here, it just gives me joy. I, I love them. We have a new member, Mr. Nick Wolfer. Shout out to you, Nick. I have, I will have a video for you, a members only. My four top holsters coming up. I will upload that as soon as we're done with the stream. He says, uh, he's been with us for four months. Um, Nick says, what are your thoughts on transitioning? I have a sister who started years ago and is still in the process. I believe it's sickness and I struggle with it. Yeah, well, I, I can't speak to every single case, um, but a lot of it is, um, do you know, do you know how much money is exchanging hands in this movement? Like a, like a sex change when everything is said and done is almost a half a million dollars to the surgeons. I, I fear, I don't fear, I know um, that this, a lot of this is motivated. Some of it is ideology, but a lot of it is motivated, for, uh, motivated by finances. And there's a lot of, I, I, think, it's, I think it's deplorable um, at, at a young age. Uh, I think it's child abuse, abuse in my opinion. Um, are there situations that I don't know all the details of where, you know, I don't know. I can't speak to all these things, but, but I, I, it's, peop, it's adults pushing um, their ideas to, on children at a very vulnerable point of their life. You know, you know what love bombing is? It's, very, it's a very effective method that is used by cults, um, multi-marketing type of businesses, um, religions, uh, and this sort of thing, where there is so much pressure upon, especially girls and young boys in, in the public schools and such, to be a certain way or to look a certain way. And, and it's a very difficult time, if you go back and you remember, uh, to, you want to fit in. If you're a little bit odd in any way, or you don't meet the standards physically, and now you become, people are bullying you or ostracizing you. It's a, don't underestimate that as a competent, capable adult. Don't un underestimate the, the psychological trauma and how horrible that is when you're 12, 13, 14, 15 to deal with. Let's not be unsympathetic to that, right? So we all had to go through that, and it was all terrible for all of us. But when you're going through that and an adult offers you a remedy that they're, they're telling you, there's a remedy to this. And now you have the ability to step into um, a culture or a group of people that are just are love bombing you. That you went from being bullied and ostracized in school to now that you're being shown support and love and hugs and encouragement. Do you not understand how, how addictive that would be to be part of that, to just to come out of this horrible environment in public school into an environment where, you, where everyone is love bombing you and giving you encouragement and paying attention to you? And then they're offering you a remedy and you're 13, 14, you don't even know who you are. You don't know anything. Are we to say that tomboys of the past, that, that you know, the girl, some girls go through a tomboy phase that all of them should have had a sex change or, or been you know, transitioning. Oh, you know, in the past, they, they came out of it and, and became you know, mothers and wives and daughters and all that. But to make decisions, uh, adults offering these um, procedures that they're saying that this is a fix for the uncomfortable or the embarrassment that you're experiencing in your adolescence, that this is a, a fix that's irreversible and is, is going to destroy your ability in the future to possibly have children um, of your own at that age. I take a very dim view on that. I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's horrible. And God will judge uh, people that are doing this. There are people doing it because they think it's right. Maybe it is right for some situation. I don't know. I, I, I can't, sp I, I have a tendency to want to speak in absolutes. And that is, uh, well, the world's just not in absolutes. You guys are lucky 
then I'm not uh, the one sitting in judgment because I would be a hard, <laughs> harsh judge. <laughs> this is the way it is and this is the way it, it not is. And that's what's so wonderful about when we read through the 66 books, which is the history of God dealing with, with his, peep, his children in a fallen state of how many accommodations he makes um, and workarounds he makes because he understands that, that, that there's a lot of tough situations and, and you can't just put everyone in the same camp. So... I'm, not, I'm trying not to do that as well. I'm trying to follow my, my, the example of my leader, uh, Jesus Christ, and how he dealt with people. Uh, but it is, um, yeah, the human nature is, is very judgmental. I was raised in a very judgmental Christian cult. And so that, I would be crazy to think that that doesn't affect me today. That's why I think why I'm so black and white is because it was imprinted upon me that when, I was, when I was little. And I don't know any other way. Only now at 50 am I starting to understand, hey, you know, there's, there's sometimes there's two sides to a story. And there's people in difficult situations. And I'm very, it's very easy for me to get up here on my soapbox and start saying this is how it is and this is how it isn't. So I understand that as well. But I also understand the plight of these kids at that age. That's very diff a diff difficult time. I don't blame them. I do blame the adults that are, are profiting from it. That's a great sin. And God will judge them harshly. But um, no, I sympathize, Bill. I, I sympathize. I don't have the answers. But one thing that you need to pay attention to is that when you're watching these videos of parents taking their children to tranny story time in the libraries, etc., go look and see which parent is taking them. And it's not the father's. There may be an occasional beta male that's orbiting out there hoping to pick up some scrap somewhere, but you don't see men taking their little daughters and their little sons to these things. You see single mothers doing it. And I wonder how many of them are doing it to get even with a father that they've divorced. The good book tells us a woman tears down her house with her own hands. And never has there been a truer statement than that. We have a super chat from Mr. Hudson Wade. Hudson says, is divorce ever justified? For instance, in the case of unfaithful partner. Yeah, absolutely it is. Not only an unfaithful partner, but it seems to me, and this is, this is just my opinion, but if the covenant is broken in any way, then you are well within your rights to, to, to put that woman out. If you marry someone that was fit, took care of herself, and she becomes um, orca fat, gains 200 pounds, is sitting on the couch, and now is not mobile and suffering from health conditions. Are you, you, as a man who has taken care of himself, are you obligated to stay in that marriage? No, of course not. The contract has been broken. The covenant has broken. There's been an agreement. There were expectations of both parties, and that goes both ways. That goes both ways, beloved. So unfaithfulness, that's a big one. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a, there would be no redemption for that for me. I would not, that would, uh, there would be no do-overs. Um, uh, someone that was not taking care of themselves or not pulling their weight around the house, not raising the, yeah, there are lots of things. If that co covenant has been broken, God made covenants with many of the, of the men in the old days of the old, of the old Testament. And God broke those covenants when the conditions were not being met. King Saul, the first king of Israel, that, that, when that condition was, was no longer met, that that covenant was broken uh, and null and void. And the same goes. That's an example. If our Heavenly Father did it, then we, are, we should act accordingly. Yeah, you know, you, you don't, brothers, you don't have to suffer um, through an abusive mate that is not honoring the agreement. Uh, you would be better off just to cut it loose. Um, and I would, you know, everyone has their own case and you have to, you know, you have to be okay with this. You have to square this with your God. But in, in so doing, if you come to that conclusion, then you walk away with a clear conscience and you um, see, see it for what it is. We have a super chat from Mr. Tyler. Buhai, Tyler, shout out to Tyler. Tyler's a brand new member, welcome. He says, Cody, I'm 34 and an emergency vehicle technician. I own a home in rural Pennsylvania. I have a traditional wife and two kids. Any advice 
from a man to man thank you. So Tyler is 34. He's a mechanic. He works on emergency vehicles and more than a mechanic. There's a lot of uh, tech. There's a lot of technology in those emergency vehicles now. You have to be pretty squared away. A lot of a lot of electrical. I can imagine. Uh, he owns his home in Pencil rural Pennsylvania. Traditional wife, two kids. Man, you're doing it. It sounds like you're winning to me. It sounds like you're winning, and it sounds like you're doing it right. Uh, the advice would be that uh, your family, as a man that is doing it right, like you're doing it with a traditional woman and such, your family is going to be under attack by the adversary. You have to, the biggest advice that I could give you is, is do not forsake, uh, stay close to your wife. Be encouraging to her, be attentive to her needs as well, and, and also uh, spend time and, and pray together. Pray together for guidance and wisdom and understand, you know, she's, if she's teaching, she's at home with the kids, you know, that's, a lot of us guys, it's easy for us to say, you know, we're out in the hot weather and the cold, rainy, out in the mud, you know, earning a living and what we do is hard and all she has to do is sit at home and in a warm house and, and she can do anything she wants and watch TV and what have you, you know, we get that, but it's, it's, it's a difficult job. It's a difficult job, especially if she's got kids at home and homeschooling all the day. As an adult being with little kids all the time, it just it wears on you. It, it is not to be underestimated. So be conscious of that and also have a, just be conscious of her mood and, and what's going on and her stress level and, and be there to, to be a support to her as well. If you can give her a little bit of break or a relief when she's super stressed out, even though you've worked all day, get up there and, and help with the dishes. Or, um, as I said, take her out. Say, hey, let's, let's pack up the kids. You don't, don't cook tonight. Let's not do that. Let's go out and, and we'll go get a pizza. You know, be receptive to that sort of thing. And just praying together is really important. Praying together, understanding her plight. Um, and you will just, if you have a good woman, the little act of, what I've noticed, like with Mrs. W, if I do one thing kind to her, I get 10 back. It's just the way that they are. If a woman is really pair bonded with you and, and it respects you and loves you, um, their whole world is about taking care of you and, 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 and they look outside themselves and it, it just benefits you. So understand her plight. Make sure you set time aside. Get a babysitter, you know, once a month or twice a month if you can. And it's not about spending a lot of money. It's just really the thought of it. The thought that you called ahead to make reservation at her favorite restaurant. Take her out and uh, surprise her. Women like surprises. They like that. So have do mystery dates. Uh, it could just be something simple. One thing that Mrs. W and I used to do that we still talk about today that was so fun when we didn't have any money and I wanted to take her out to do something is we'd go out and, and, and get a burger or something cheap and then um, we would go to hit the local thrift stores and it's like I give her you know twenty dollars and I had twenty dollars and we had two hours and, and let's see what we can get and we would go and have dates where we go and, and see what we could find cool stuff. Uh, you know, just little things like that. Um, just remember that that this is a supporter, and uh, you'll receive that back. The reciprocity you'll get will be tenfold. Shout out to Tyler and his Tradcon woman. I like to see that. We have a super chat from Can. We appreciate how much effort he puts into these videos. Is that your name? <laughs> That's a long name. Uh, he says, no trolling, but does grounding bed make a difference? Now, I don't know. You know, I... People have still been asking me about this. I wasn't successful at it. <clears throat> I, I roll. I'm very active sleepers. So I roll around and move around a lot. Um, and so uh, what happened was the, the tape all came off and started jabbing me. And uh, I made it for a couple hours. I st kept straightening it out. And then finally I had enough at 2 in the morning or whatever. And I tore it off and threw it on the ground. And then I haven't done it since. So, But I do cont can tell you that I got my... I'm not that flexible. Uh, <laughs> I stay grounded out in the shop, even when it's cold out here, and that, uh, that is definitely beneficial. So I would recommend it. Also, not only that, if you want to look at something that's kind of interesting, and this is something that's starting to become, a lot of people are coming aware of, uh, even like 10 years ago, I started seeing shoes made differently, especially if this has been kind of led by the ultra marathoners and ultra runners, where people that are, are coming out of Western civilization 
and participating in activities like ultra running where they're, where they're running long distances, you know, way beyond marathons, 100 miles or even in excess of 100 miles. And that starts to uh, show the deficiencies of bone growth in our feet and, and how far we've come by wearing shoes that have pinched our feet into a little, pinched our toes all together. If you look at a Western foot and go look at a, at a, a foot of a native person that is on their feet uh, without the shoes and the fashion and all of that, their feet look completely different. Their toes are all splayed out very wide. They're, they have a really great balance, very good athleticism. And um, shoes, like 10 years ago, started uh, to portray that. There are shoes now that are opening up. I have a pair of um, zero drop shoe, different things I used to try uh, to get that, to make that happen. And what I've noticed is that from years and years of wearing cowboy boots, which are some of the worst things you can wear on your feet, they drive your toes in. It got to, mine were so bad when I finally kind of took them off that my pinky toe was, was, was mashed and kind of curled up and just permanently formed underneath the other one. Um, and it was just stuck there from it. Just, it's like feet binding. That, that's not good for you. That can't be good for you. Not, God didn't design us to wear these silly things. Cowboy boots, there was a need for them for a specific application. The cowboy boots are designed with a point so they fit in the stirrups and the high heel so that they don't pass through. That was required for, for riding and staying uh, seated in, in a saddle. Well, they've worked their way into, you know, it's a fashion, you know, kind of a, fa a cultural thing now. But is it healthy for your feet? Is that No, it's not. So if you're in those things all the time and wearing them all the time, you know, I would encourage you to get out of them. My feet are actually changing. I spend so much time barefoot now. Almost most of all my time is barefoot, unless it's really cold, I'm out in the cold, is that you're in snow. Uh, but my, my, my feet are opening up. Uh, my arches and my balance and stability is stronger and better. So even if you just take the whole grounding aspect out of it, the benefits that come from getting yourself out of those pinched shoes uh, is very important, very important. So I don't know, I don't have an answer. We have a super chat from our friend Jamie. Jamie's been with us for a couple months. Shout out to Jamie. Jamie says, how do you feel about the use of Roundup for weed control around the home? Any good alternatives? Do not, beloved, do not even have Roundup, Roundup on your property. That, that, is a, a, that is a very, very toxic poison. Goodness. I thought we were beyond that. I can't even believe that that's a discussion. No, years ago, when I started becoming aware of, of the birth defects, oh, goodness, that stuff is among, I, it is, I'll, I'll, I've done the research on that. I encourage you to do that. But if that is in your garden shed, get rid of it, any of it. I did that years ago. Once I became aware of the, these toxic chemicals, like I can't even, like to go into a Home Depot, now that I am so much um, cleaner, I guess, in my diet, um, the, my enhanced senses from, from the Wim Hof and the cold shower are greatly enhanced. Even before that, I couldn't go anywhere near the chemical aisles of a, like a coastal, like a farm store or a Home Depot where they sell all that poison. Just the smell of it coming from the containers all, w w would almost overcome me. Like, and I, I, I walked, I've walked into places where, uh, like farm stores, where they have so many of those chemicals that I had to, as soon as I walked in, there was no escape. I had to turn around and walk out. And I looked in there and there were people that worked 40 hours a week in there, in those poisons. And it was so toxic that, that I couldn't even breathe in there. I turned around like, I can't even shop in this place. It's so toxic. Goodness. You've got, you're going to put that on, out on your, uh, your garden and your grass and your pets are going to go out there and your children are going to go out there and you're going to walk through it and you're going to bring back that back into your house. and can, Oh, goodness. Goodness. For goodness sakes, get that out of your home. Was I unclear, Jamie? No, I'm not, I'm not getting down on you. I didn't know either. I used to use that stuff as well. But man, even ten, you know, probably 20, 20 years, 15, 20 years ago, maybe 15. No, when Jack was little. I, I kind of became aware of that when Jack was little. Yeah, it, no, al alternatives. You got to get it out of that mind. You got to get out of the mindset of having everything being perfect and manicured. That, that's a boomer notion that needs to die with them, hopefully. That, I mean, this is foolishness. If you don't want weeds, put some bark, chip, bark chips down. 
put the bark chips down, and when the weeds will come up there, they'll you reach you reach down there and grab them, and they'll just pull out as easy as can be. That's the solution. Use nature's. There's no weeds in the forest. Why? Why are there no weeds in the forest? Well, all of the litter falls down. The pine needles and the fir needles and the little pieces of bark, all that falls down. The acidic level of it discourages it, but it also protects the, it, it keeps the moisture in the ground. The reason why you have weeds, the weeds are there for a reason. When you see dandelions that are, that are spread out through a field, why do they do that? Why are there dandelions? Dandelions are nature's way of breaking up the soil. The soil has become so dry because all of the trees and all of the cover and all the grasses have all been plowed under or rototilled in and the soil is dying and the, the dandelions light there and they have such deep powerful roots that they go down deep into the soil and they are able to break it up. And, that, and that's, what they're, that's what they're for. That's why, that's why their roots are so deep and so hard to get out. So when you see dandelions, that's just a red flag for this land, this soil. This is not being taken care of properly. Something's wrong here. If it, you know, we get around it by constant irrigating, but is that going to be sustainable in the future? You know, probably not. So we look to, the, we look to how, how, does, how does nature handle weeds? Well, like the forest, there are no weeds in the forest, the, the litter. So what you can do is bark chips. So if you have a problem with that, you know, you don't, how much grass do you need? Maybe have a small little bit of grass if you want to have it around your place. Uh, why have something you have to go and maintain? You have to go out and spend your weekends on mowing. You know, why, why deal with that? Why have that? Get yourself a rented chipper. Go buy a dump truck load of chips. Spread those things around. Put them on once a year. Rake them around. It's going to hold the soil. It's going to hold the moisture in the soil. And it's going to be, everything is going to be, you're, you're, build, you're, you're building soil that's going to be useful to you if you need to plant or grow in it. You're not going to have to irrigate. Uh, and there's so many benefits of it that we saw. And when weeds do come up, because of the ground is so soft underneath there, you just grab them and pull them out. And with the time you spend pulling out a few weeds once in a while is going to be half of what you spend mowing. But goodness, if you've got to put, you look at the underlying problems. If you've got weeds, ask yourself, why do I have weeds? And then the solution being, we're just going to sp spray a bunch of toxins on it. They're going to contaminate ourselves and affect our health to get rid of weeds. Goodness. Perish the thought. Shout out to you, Jamie. Don't do what the boomers did. We have a super chat from Wyatt Dupre. Wyatt Dupre. That sounds very French to me. Shout out to the French, man. They're getting it done over there, aren't they? I saw yesterday, day before yesterday, that the police are starting to, to join the, the protesters. I don't think the pigs in this country would have the ability to do that. They're too worried about their own uh, paychecks, but um, maybe, maybe. But it really is. The, the pigs, the cops, really are the, enemy, are the enemies of freedom, beloved. I mean, I, I grew up with uh, my, my patriotism and back to blue and all of that as well, um, but that was wrong. It is the pigs that will be the, are the ones that are, will enforce the will of the corrupt politicians upon you. All they've got to do is call them and the pigs in blue will show up with guns and they will beat you or shoot you and kill you and drag you and throw you in a cage the moment you don't tow the line uh, to some tyrant. And that's the enforcement arm of it. Without them, they have no power. So you really need to take a look. They really are the problem. They're, they really are. They are the enforcement arm. They are the sledgehammer that will smash you the moment you run afoul of the corrupt politicians. So don't look at them as your savior. Uh, they are not your savior. They are, by and large, the problem. We have a super chat from Mr. Wyatt Dupre. Oh, sorry, I, didn't, I don't know what happened there. I missed it. As a, man, as a man, my goal was having children, but my wife is unable. What should my main focus of life be on now? 
He wants children. Wyatt wants children, but his wife is unable. What should I? Well, you know, I mean, there, the, you can adopt. You can adopt. I mean, there, 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 that's, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to have a family. Um, there, that's always an option. Um, if you want kids, then make it happen. Just because you can't have your own doesn't mean that you can't, you can't make that happen. We, we're surrounded by pet family and not families. I know it's expensive and difficult, but we're surrounded. Uh, there are so many families in the Valley that have adopted children, some from here, some from overseas. I mean, just from throwing a stone, I could probably hit half a dozen. So that they're doing it. There's no reason why you can't do it. So, I mean, that's an easy solution. That's an easy solution. I, I wouldn't look at that as a, being a barrier. You're not the only one, and there are a lot of kids in need. So, I as distasteful as it is to get involved with the uh, with the foster care system and all of the hoops and everything you have to jump through and and how invasive they are. If it's important to you and you want that to happen, you just need to suck it up and spend the two years and go through their training and go through their home inspections and all their nonsense. And then once you have it and once the paperwork is all signed, then it's yours and they're out of your they're out of your hair. So there's an option. You can do that. I would exhaust that before I would start looking at alternatives. You know, you know about that now. If you were to 20 years down the road and you're old and alone and you don't have any family, you know, are you going to look at it and say, you know, I know it was going to be a pain and I didn't want to deal with it and it was all the money and all of that, but w will you think about that? How will you look at it in 20 years? So if, you have, if you're young enough to do it now and you're at the age where you can have children, then just do it. Just resolve to do it and to do it. Look, look and see what your options are. Maybe you're in a position financially where you can adopt overseas. We have many, many friends that have gotten on planes um, and brought home uh, children from foreign countries. So don't, you can't tell me it's not possible because it's done all the time. We have a super chat from our friend, Mr. Jason Barr. Shout out to you, Jason. Good to see you here. Jason writes, the manservant and I are on a work trip today. Would love to hear your thoughts on being a handyman as a career. There's never been a better time, Jason. Uh, and I'm glad to see that you that you've acquired a, a manservant. I, I would recommend it. I, I have one. <clears throat> My manservant, unfortunately, is, um, is home with a, with a cold today. He, he <laughs> bless him, he called up this morning and said, I'll, I'll, I'm coming in. I just want you to know that I'm not feeling very good and um, I'm going to stay outside because I've got a, you know, got a bad head cold going on or something. And, and Mrs. W said, goodness, stay home. Just stay home and... Uh, and uh, get better and come back when you're feeling better. Uh, handyman, yeah. If you, a handy, there's never been a better time to be a handyman. If you don't, if, if you are, um, are you dying, Mama Kitty? Are you okay? Goodness, you hacking up a fur, fur ball? You never know what's gonna happen with a 20 year old cat. Are you okay? You okay? Don't know what that was. Cat, cats are kind of gross. Uh, if, if you don't, yeah, if you want to be self-employed and you want to make a good living, uh, man, a guy in a pickup with a with a tool belt uh, is good, is in demand right now. Facebook Marketplace, you can advertise there uh, your services, and there's just such a need. There's so many. There's so many uh, households without husbands, without men. Um, and women are, a lot of them are useless when it comes to fixing clogged up toilets or broken screen door or broken window. They're not doing any of that. And then they call, they, and they don't have the means uh, to hire a tradesman and, it, or it's too expensive. There's a tremendous need for that right now. So if you're, uh, if you're willing to do that sort of thing, then that's going to be a, a cash business by and large. Set yourself up a Venmo account. Um, people are pretty, com you know, Venmo is pretty standard now. Uh, you can use that. Having that form of payment is going to double the jobs that you get. Plus, you'll get some cash jobs and different things. But man, put that out there. Specialize in one thing that you know how to do, and then you'll expand upon that. So pick something relatively simple, uh, like uh, painting, for example. You know, small, small painting jobs and such. You can get up to speed on that, no problem, right? And small sheds and different things you know you don't need to have expensive equipment if you do you can rent it you'll learn on, on YouTube 
And what you'll find when you get out there is that upper, other opportunities are going to arise. Oh, hey, while you're here, uh, can you fix my squeaky door? Or, or can you uh, change the, the locks here? Or can you glaze in a new window here? Or can you clean out my gutters? So the idea would be, if you're going to get into the handyman service, is like, okay, what do I need to be the most effective? Uh, and you'll learn. Uh, but don't get it over your head. Just kind of focus on one thing, and you can really get that dialed and get it down well, and then start expanding on it. But where you start with is get yourself a pickup or a van. If you live in an area that's prone to theft and such, a van is much more secure. Make sure you, you know, don't keep things in sight, obviously. Uh, but some sort of a rack on it. You're going to want some ladders so you can get up and clean out gutters and such. You're going to want to have, um, you know, your basic tools, your tool belt. You know, all it, the tools are so good now with the cordless stuff. You know, you don't have to, you can be kind of self-sufficient. You don't have to have extension cords and, you know, things are just, it's never been a better time to do this. But there's a tremendous need for that. And if you can kind of maybe even couple that uh, work in with your goal of ultimately getting yourself like a 14-foot dump trailer that you can pull behind your truck, you know, now you've got the ability to, to start hauling uh, trash and stuff or, uh, cleaning out garages, uh, and th there's all sorts of benefits from that as well. Or even just, um, you know, keep your vehicle and everything nice and clean. Have your name and yourself clean, spotless, shaved, cut, tucked, tucked in shirt, a professional. And make your equipment and your tools look the same. Put your name on the side, your email address or what have you, your services, and you'll start getting calls from people, hey, You'll park your dump trailer there for the weekend so they can unload their garage and you take it to the dump and you make 500 bucks doing that. You know, it, it, it's, if you want to get out there and hustle a little bit, you can do it. That's what I did, man. When I bought my heavy equipment, I didn't have anyone giving me any work. I didn't have, I didn't have money coming in. I had to go out and knock on doors. Even when I was in high school, I, okay, I'm going to be a car detailer now. Is, was I going to just buy the equipment? Someone was going to show up at my house and like, hey, detail my car? No, I had to go down and do it with the dealers. And I went down to the car dealers. Hey, I'll do it. Oh, we already have a guy. Well, I'll do it for less. Well, okay, we'll try you out. That's how you do it. That's how you get started. As a young man, you've got a lot of time. You've got time to hustle and, and to do things and to learn things. And, and there's a lot of opportunities for that. I, that would be, I would rather be a handyman with my own stuff uh, than uh, slaving at some factory job somewhere, hands down. It's a good question. Shout out to Jason Barr at his manservant. Make sure you take care of your manservant. Don't, don't, uh, make sure he's taken care of. You, your manservant's important. Mr. Brendan Bourne has been with us for six months. We've got a super chat from Brendan. Shout out to you, Brendan. Brendan writes, I think you recently mentioned a Navy SEAL who transitioned. I think I saw that he was detransitioning and was doing an interview with Michaela Peterson. Ugh. Straight up 304. You know, she abandoned her child. See, so a single mother, right? A train wreck. She abandoned her child with someone to go and to... Ho, uh, whore herself while out with Andrew Tate. Go look into that. She's not a virtuous woman, in my opinion. Um, virtuous women don't do that. Yeah, uh, I forget his name, but I, I don't know about that interview. She puts me off. I, I can't stand her. Um, but I would go over to the, one you, the interview you want, you want to watch uh, about him, and I would strongly encourage you to watch it. It's excellent. Uh, it'll make you rethink a lot of the things you thought. And what an extraordinary man, absolutely brilliant, is go to Vigilance, Vigilance Elite. It's a YouTube channel. Sean Ryan, he's also an ex-Navy ex SEAL and CIA guy. And he is doing a great service um, to a lot of the men who have fought in special forces in, in these three decades of war um, by sharing their stories as they go through. What's really interesting is that these guys that he's interviewing, like Navy SEALs and um, Army Rangers and uh, Delta guys, uh, Green Berets and such, you know, just the best that America has to offer. Um, you know, these guys are smart. You can't, be, you can't get into these particular 
jobs at the highest level like this without being extremely intelligent and, 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 and having a clue. These are not dumb, dumb people by any means. But these guys, I've watched a lot of interviews on him, uh, on his channel, almost all of them. And, and what's kind of sad, and all, uh, this is happening to all of us, is that these guys that were over there, you know, killing brown people, uh, are realizing that they were lied to and that what they did and uh, what they w were doing, that th what they were told that they were doing out of pure patriotism and it was the right thing, and if we don't fight them over there, we're going to fight them over here and all of that propaganda. You know, once they were over there and they saw what it was really about, which was enriching defense contractors and politicians and corrupt politicians at that, um, and that what they, a lot of what they had done was not only in vain but, but morally maybe wrong, now that we have the vision of hindsight, that, that, that they're struggling with this. And, it's, and one, thing about, one thing that's very nice about Sean's, what Sean is doing over there in Vigilance Elite is he's giving, giving a, um, a voice to these very high profile people um, that is reaching a, a lot of other vets that are struggling with this as well. You know, we know the suicide rates uh, of, of, of our veterans. You know, it, it's, a, it's a natural, natural disgrace is what, what's going on and how the government's not supporting these men. But I, it seems to me that ha interviewing these people and seeing that the guys even at the highest level are struggling with these things and how they're dealing with it and how they're overcoming it is, is bringing a lot of help and, and encouragement to, to those that may be considering of, of do, doing something you know, that, that can't be reversed. And so his interview with, um, oh, I wish I could na na remember his name. Goodness, could the middlemen, could you guys, would one of you be so kind, just go over to Vigilance Elite, Sean Ryan's channel. It's going to be in his last few videos. And drop in a link for the beloved here of that interview. And I forget the guy's name, but he's the Navy SEAL that transitioned. And he's in the picture, he's wearing a purple plaid shirt. It'd be pretty easy to find. If you could go over and get that and drop that in here, I would encourage you, beloved, all of you strongly to watch that. No matter how you think about the trans community and how, how you feel about that, just go and watch it, and it's going to be very enlightening for you. It was for me. It gave me a lot more compassion. Like going through the death of my father gave me compassion, the ability to, to be compassionate to those who have went through that before me that I didn't have before. This has given me a lot more compassion towards people that are going through this because a lot of them are just not getting good information and they're being, being given a solution which looks really, really good that, um, that may or may not be. That's all I'm saying. We have a super chat from Zippy the Unicorn who says, Cody, I have the answer, but not the soapbox. Yeah, I do get up on my soapbox when <laughs> I do my thought. Yeah, you know, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm going to be crazy. Uh, it would be insane for me to think that I came out of the, the crazy Christian cult environment that I was raised in without being somewhat unscathed by it. And... You know, maybe it's maybe it's not good to have too much time on your hands. <laughs> and I, you know, through COVID, I had a lot of time on my hands. I think a lot of us had time on our hands. And and for me, all of the all of the maybe the trauma and the and the bad things that childhood problems that came out of that, I was able to I just put that in a box over here and close that box up and shoved it over in the dark because uh, I was too busy um, living my life and getting married and raising my kids and trying to get businesses started, just trying to get a foothold in this cruel world, right? And uh, that's why I think that a, a lot of, especially with men, a lot of the majority of, the, of depression that men suffer from can easily be overcome uh, by simply having a purpose in life. Because when you don't have a, when your purpose is not really defined and you have too much time on your hands, those old uh, things start creeping up, creeping up on you and you have more time to think about things that... Um, maybe you're best not thought about. Uh, not everything needs to be analyzed to death and need to be l 
constantly swimming in your past and wallowing in these things. Yeah, bad things happen to me. Bad things happen to you. Bad things happen to all of us. This isn't a contest. But uh, what does that have to do with us today? I don't know, man. We have a super chat from Mr. I, but I don't know. Yeah, Soapbox. Well, shout out to you nonetheless. We have a super chat from our friend Gamer Dave. Welcome, Mr. Dave. Dave says, hey, Cody, hope life is good. You'll be happy to know I packed in smoking, drinking, and got over my painkiller addiction for all this year so far now. Goodness, that is a great accomplishment, David. That would be a great accomplishment just to, to, to shake off one of those things, and you've done all three of them for a full year. I know how hard that is. I know how hard that is. You know, I can't emphasize the importance for a man of having a purpose and being useful. And we, uh, us Western men, especially us American men, really are, pr are, are susceptible to that because our value, because I'm so fond of saying really, if we think about it, our value, we on, we're only valuable for one thing in this culture. Uh, and that is, it's not for our kindness or love, compassion or faithfulness or honor. It is based upon our ability to produce. And we are judged by our ability to produce. Just go into parties or company and watch how people will change how they see you the moment that they know what you do for a living if it's not something that's interesting or not something that they consider as high value. And you'll see it. You'll watch, you can watch their face turn. Your value as an American Western man is based on your ability to produce resources. Is that right? No, it's not right. It's terrible. We're, we're more than that, beloved. We're some of, the, some of the most kind, compassionate, most helpful, um, trustworthy, high trust people, honest, integrity, faithful men in this whole world. That's our, that's our default. Who's willing to go down and volunteer in, in a situation more than Americans are, and American men, men in particular? Who's, wh tell me American men are not willing to go over and help their neighbor when he's in need compared to so many other cultures where it's, it's just, oh, that's your problem, not my problem. I'm not getting involved, especially Europe. You know, Americans are extraordinary that way. But we're not, we're not um, celebrated for that. We're only ce celebrated for our ability to produce resources. So you grow up with that, and that's how you, if, you don't, if you're not deliberate about it, that's how you think, and that's how you see yourself. So when you find yourself in a situation, maybe you, you're a young man that has not even been able to get a start because you're black-pilled and you, you're surveying the land and you, it, you, you're hopeless. You see the hopelessness of it. Well, you're going to, how are you going to feel about yourself when your only value comes from your ability to produce resources? And everyone, especially our, the Western women, are going to reinforce that. If you're broke and dusty, do you have any value in the society to a Western woman? None. Are they right? They're not right, but after, if, that, if that's all you see and all you're subject to, of course you're going to feel that way. So you're going to see, you're going to internalize that and you're going to see yourself as being a failure and you have no use and you're going to consider ending yourself because your only value comes from that. But that's not true. What you need to realize is that your, satis your, your happiness and satisfaction in life is not derived through a woman. That's where everything has been twisted. A woman can be a great accessory to you, or she can be the worst thing that ever happened to you. But your happiness needs to come from your personal achievements and your goal, whatever that may be. Maybe it's your goal to go and study plants in the forest and, and, to, and to have come up with research that, that is the next penicillin. You know, it doesn't make any difference, whatever. Maybe it is, maybe you're building race cars. Maybe you're building the most beautiful custom bikes in the world, or you're the, or a, a welder, or what have you. It makes a difference, but having a purpose is the most important thing. You, you, you're created in the image of God. You are heir to the promise of God. You have value. You're unique. There's no one like you. God tells us that when we enter into the kingdom with him, he gives us a stone, and on that stone is written a name. And that name is a unique name that no one else has. It's a new name given to you, not the one given to you by your parents. And what that signifies 
is that no one's going to know that name except for you and God, that you and him have a special connection that no one else ever created has that's unique and individual, that that is a personal connection, so intimate that only you know one another, only he knows your name and no one else. That speaks to the importance of, of who we are and what we've been created. And all society and the adversary has, has worked to tell you that you're nothing and that you're nothing more than a meal ticket or you're nothing more than a paycheck. And that's not true. Don't listen to these women. women getting advice from women and, and seeking the approval of women is not where it's at. That's going to bring you happy, uh, misery because they're just people as well. You need to understand your value to your creator, to your God, and that you have a place and a specific reason to be here. Some people for great things, some people for lesser. It doesn't mean that one's less than the other. Each one, everyone gets the same stone in the kingdom. But once you have a purpose in life, then you don't suffer with depression and such. You have something that when you get up in the bed, that you're uh, in the morning from bed, that you're excited and you're eager because you have a purpose, that you, you do something. You do something that's of value. And the women, they will come if it's, if it's your will to do that. But that's an accessory to help you in your cause, not to, not to judge you. They don't determine whether you're valuable or not, beloved. You determine that. God's already set you on the path. He's made you unique. So just move forward and, and don't seek approval from other people. You're more in life than just a paycheck for some ungrateful, spoiled brat. I have a very, you know, I, I go hard on the 304s out here, but I, I see them as a big problem. I have a very, a very tender spot in my heart for, for men especially our young men that are here today, and I understand what you're going through, and I understand your, your struggles. And I've been there before, you know. I've, I know what it's like. It's difficult. I've had my struggles, you know, worse than some, not as bad as, as others. I, I get it. And it was easier when I was younger. It's not fair. It's more difficult now. I understand that. But just don't lose hope, man. Your condition and, and the situation you find yourself, you might be living still with your parents and just you can't get anything going and you can't kick your porn addiction, you can't kick your weed addiction. You know, you can kick all that stuff so easily if you, if you just have a reason to go on and to get up and to do something. You have a purpose. Having a purpose is, is absolutely everything. And one thing that can change very quickly is your situation. So use the logic that God has given you and realize that this is a temporary situation that I'm in that can change. In one year, things could be very different. If you just took your body, let's say you're 60, 70 pounds overweight, and you turned into Jello Man from your chicken tendies, right? You're not, <coughs> you're not in very good shape, you're not taking care of yourself. You know what type of a transformation can be made in 12 months. We had one of our pro ho here last, last week that dropped you know, nearly uh, 40 pounds, 40 pounds. And how did he do it? Simply by just going down to one meal a day. You could change your physical appearance in one year if you resolve to do that. And just that one act uh, and getting a purpose, a job or starting a business or handyman, you'd be, you could be looking at getting into your own place inside of a year. You could be uh, completely transformed your body and your energy. I mean, there's, the situation you find yourself in is very temporary, and you can change that, but no one's going to change it for you. And it can start with just these simple things like that. You know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Jordan Peterson, but one thing, the, the thing that he did say that was wise was just to start by cleaning up your room. You know, I'll tell you the reason why when you look at my closet, I have a small walk-in closet, Everything is neat and hung up and orderly there. I spend time in there to brush my clothes and I fold my handkerchiefs and I put my shirts away and I fold everything up and I put my socks neatly in the, in the drawer. I have that and, and my shop. <clears throat> I try to keep my tools organized and when I come in, I clear off cluttered surfaces. I don't have just piles of garbage and junk and all that. that even with all of the chaos in my life and all of the unfinished things and all the obligations, at least when I start my day and I go into my closet, I, I start with some order. And then I come out to my shop. I start with order, put my clothing on. They're clean because I take care of them and I clean them before I put them away. 
put clean socks on. When I want something, I know where it's at because I put it there. I would have fewer, very few clo clothing, just five pair of pants, so I'm not constantly looking for something or making, a dis making decisions. It's simple for me. It's clean, it's orderly, it's organized, I'm surrounded with things that I like. It starts my day off right. I come out to my shop, and my shop is organized. I need to need something. I don't have the frustration. There's no dead battery for my camera because I have a place for it, and I put it away before I shut. I locked up the shop. I need a, to take a spark plug out. I know where my 3 8 drive ratchet is, my 6-inch extension, and my spark plug adapter because I put it in a particular place. And that, even though there's chaos around my life and things I can't control, and this extends out to, the, out to all of the, the scary stuff going out in the world and the, and the uncertainty with the, the economy. And are we going to war or are we not going to war? Am I going to have a job tomorrow or am I not going to have a job? All of those things, all those uncertainties, they put a lot of stress upon us. You may not realize that, but that's, you're constantly, you've been in a fight or flight for the last eight to three years. So having a temple of solitude which could be your closet, could be your bedroom, could be your car that is neat and orderly and as good as it can be is a, is a fortress of protection from all of the chaos of the world in just a small thing. It's one thing that you can control in a world that is completely uncontrollable. So that advice that P Jordan Peterson gave about cleaning up your room was extraordinary, exceedingly insightful and I think very helpful. We have a super chat from M. Morrison. Shout out to you, Mr. Morrison. M writes, hey, Cody, hope life is good. You'll be happy to know I packed in smoking, drinking. Oh, I just read that. Good for you, game, Gamer Dave. I'm very proud of you. Very proud of you. That is a difficult thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. I, I can relate. I understand. I've, I've struggled with, with all of those myself in the past. Mr. Mason Mr. Mason has been with us for a month. Shout out to you. A very generous super chat. Thank you very much. Welcome. Mr. Mason says, I'm 20 and sick of the daily grind lining my boss's pockets. I'm thinking of getting into HVAC and starting my own company in Texas. My grandpa has an HVAC company, is willing to teach me until I get my license. Do I go for it? Go now. Turn off this live stream. Call your grandfather and with your hat in your hand, and get on your knees and thank him for an incredible opportunity. Do you know how many young pro-ho would kill to have that opportunity right now? To have uh, a family member guide you and get you started and, and pass on to something that he's built? Uh, goodness, what an opportunity. You know what it, what it would take to get started from scratch uh, in that HVAC business if you didn't have the knowledge and the tools and such? That is a no-brainer. That's a good trade. Uh, that's an honorable trade, and there's good money to be made. The, the man that lived across the street from my, uh, my folks' house, the house that I, grew, that I was born in, that I grew up in, the house that my granddad built, uh, was an HVAC contractor, had his own business. Started small with one van, and when the, by the time he retired, he had um, not only did he have a home, there paid for. He had a vacation home. He had brand new truck, nice cars, lots of toys, motorcycles. They took, took his family out. They'd go to Sand Lake and do motorcycles and quads and all of that. Was able to help his kids get started and had uh, several employees and multiple trucks and had a really good life and made a good, good income and was a good dude. That's a great trade to be in. And goodness, God knows that the Texas man's going to need some air conditioning down in that godforsaken place. One of the most miserable summers I ever spent, hottest place in the world, was Houston, Texas, in a car with no, I, had a, I was a rental car, I had a rented a wreck. A Dodge Neon, a hateful little thing, with no air conditioning, in, through the summer in Houston, Texas. My goodness, I said, oh my goodness. That may have eclipsed Florida for misery. Shout out to you, Mr. Mason, but take your grandpa up on that and make that happen. Nothing is forever. You know, you may you look at it and you're thinking, oh, I had loftier goals. You know, I had, I had higher expectations in doing this. Don't turn your nose up at that. 
but having a trade like that and ability is is an honorable thing way more honorable than working for, for as you said lining someone's pockets who doesn't care about you and will discard you if you haven't been an entrepreneur and experienced the freedom that comes from that and just the self-respect you get from running your own thing and the confidence that you'll acquire from that you you just have no idea what's in store for you that's a great trade tin knockers we call them up here we have a super chat from mr or a member message from Kyle B. Shout out to you, Kyle. Good to see you back. Kyle writes, any advice on hunting predators? My chickens are being massacred. My days of bipedal hunting are not proving to be helpful. Man. Well, I think the main thing would be to fortify your enclosure. That's what we did. We, we, I've never had to, well, I wouldn't say never. But I, if I were to tell you what I had to do, it might not be follow all of the rules. My solution has been to fortify the enclosure. That's the number one thing. It, it is a cat and mouse game, and I don't know your particular environment. And I'm sure Southern man is, has got a, a particularly difficult um, adversary uh, that maybe we don't deal with up here in the mountains. But um, we have uh, we have them overhead and underground that give problems. So. I would work on the fortification. That's the main thing. Unless you want to be up all night on Overwatch uh, with night vision goggles, which is you're not going to get much sleep, and that might be fun for a night or two, but it will get old. But um, you're going to have to upgrade your fortification. If your chickens are in at night, I mean, I, I built a chicken house that was 100% secure. There, nothing got in there and never, ever did. It had a, we put a solar door on it. You can get a, the chicken door that goes up and down that has a photo cell on it. So... They go up the ramp and they go in at night and it closes automatically and they're secure in there. I mean, you'd have to have a, uh, the jaws of life to get in that thing or a chainsaw. There's, there's certainly nothing getting in there because I built it secure. So if it's during the day, you know, usually the main problem you're going to have is it can be solved by having a good dog around the place. Having a good dog around the place is going to keep them, them uh, critters from coming around. And then at nighttime, uh, you, you, they're in, in a safe enclosure and they're fine. So you need to work on their uh, their docile. I think is is what I would do. Miss, Mr. Northlander, we have a super chat. Says hello, Cody. Sent you an email about the shop fire that I had. Have a substantial amount coming my way and would love some advice on outfitting that. Yeah, I read that this morning. So Northlander, what happened is he had a fire. It was total loss, and a lot of the he was if memory serves a lot of the stuff he had bought. You know, kind of willy-nilly secondhand stuff but got paid out pretty good uh, for that and is going to be able in the enviable position of equipping a brand new shop how cool is that we can speak to that a little bit i don't first off i don't know i'm going to speak in very general terms for proho because proho likes to to be uh competent in many things but master really of nothing so when i think of a shop uh, there are three things that are going on. Uh, vehicle and equipment maintenance, lawnmowers, tractors, personal vehicle, oil changes, rotating tires, that sort of thing, right? That's going to be one of the third. Uh, second is going to be um, woodwork, could, could be, could not be. This is going to depend, but woodworking projects, if you like to build stuff. Uh, now, if you're just doing fences and chicken houses and you know bigger more framing house remodel sort of thing you don't really need to incorporate that into your shop you know maybe it's a store place where you store your table saw or different things like that but um, you don't need to be building a shop around that if you don't do woodworking but if you do then you need to have a wood the woodworking element of it as well and then the other the last third uh, would be the fabrication side of it Fabrication for me would include anything you're going to be doing with, with metal, grinding, uh, welding, and you're going to have, you're going to have need of a, of a metal table or a vise. So that's where I would start. When you're thinking about laying out your shop, a lot of thought should be, be considered as to ease of use. Think of the work triangle. If, if you go to commercial kitchens that are wa laid out properly or even nicer residential kitchens the the way that the sink and the range or cooktop and refrigerator why that they're situated 
should be done in, in a nice flowing triangle because you're going around to all of them. You're washing vegetables in the sink. You, so you're going to the refrigerator and then you're going to the sink and then you're going to the range to cook them. So it doesn't make any sense to have the range clear over here and the refrigerator where you're walking around the island, you get the point. So that's kind of the, the concept and the idea of what, uh, what, what you're trying to work at. So think about your workflow and what it is your accomplishment. Is it mostly automotive? Well, if it's mostly automotive, then the primo, the primary space, needs to be set aside for things that support that. Is it woodworking? Is it fabrication? If it's a good combination of both, then you, know, you think of it that way. But what I would do is before I bought anything, I would nail down what are my disciplines. Okay, I do automotive and I do fabricating. I'm not much of a woodworker, so I'm going to stick with that, right? Get a piece of graph paper, a tablet, and a pencil, and uh, lay out your space. Draw it out. First scale. Graph paper has little squares in it. Each square, we'll say, is six inches or a foot, whatever you want to do. It doesn't make any difference. Draw out the wall space, what you have. Draw out where the door is. How are you going to come in? Where's the roll-up door? Where's the man door? What, whatever. And then start putting things in there. Figure out what is, how much space does my truck take up? You know, do you have a full-size truck like mine? How wide is it? How long is it? How much space do I need? And remember that you need, just for walking space, a minimum of three feet. Just a minimum. If you're pushing toolboxes and carts, then you need five. Or six is even better. So that starts, you start, so don't still go buying stuff to put it into a space. You need to know, you need to be very deliberate with these decisions. This is a fun project. You're in a unique position to do it. So once you have the space realize and where do you want to work you know maybe some place is more inspired than another space maybe you want you you don't like southern light coming through the windows it just burns your eyes all the time I like northern light so I'm going to tend to want to work towards the north plus it's going to be cooler on the north side the shop in the south side is going to be hotter so you know that sort of thing if you're going to put a wood stove in it do you like to work around the wood stove do you like to or do you like to work at a bench I like to everything be mobile so for me in my shop almost everything is on casters so when it's cold, when it's two degrees outside, and I want to work on my snow bike, I don't want to be cold. I don't need to be cold. I want to work over here. So that means that my toolboxes and the things that I need to be need to be portable so that I can roll, roll them all over here and I can work where I want to work. So I, I, I'm not going to get into specific tools. We could get into the weeds with that. But some of the basics that you're going to need, you got to start with a vice. Spend the money on the vice. Spend, buy the best vice you can get and get something that is no smaller than a six inch. Six to eight inch jaw opening vice. Um, get a good vice, whether it be a vintage one or a Wilton or, you know, I, the, the guy on YouTube that's making the fireball vices, you know, his vices are really nice. I don't know what they cost, but I would, I would splurge on the vice. Get a good toolbox. Go on. Facebook Marketplace and get yourself a nice big roller with big deep drawers in it. You can put all your tools in that. You got a workspace up there, a worktop. Everything's going to be secure. You can lock it up and put casters on it, four casters like I did, and then you can bring that to your workspace. It's, it, that's, I'll tell you, that's one of the best things I've ever done, a good toolbox like that. You want a good bench. Uh, the best benches are going to have metal tops. A good, if you have basic fabricating skills, you should have a grinder, you know, your basic tools. You should buy yourself a good wheel, welder. Go get yourself a good entry level Millermatic welder, a 220 welder. Um, you're going to want to have a bench grinder, a good ball door bench grinder with a wire wheel on one side and, and a regular grinding wheel on the other side. Um, you want the ability to cut steel. Uh, you probably want a drill press. You know, the basic things. If you have a shop, you should you probably know these things. You know, those are the, the staples of it. When I think back, my granddad was a very frugal man, and he was an automotive. His shop was set up for automotive and fabrication. His fabrication included uh, building trailers. Small, we built small, small trailers just for us, you know, not for commercial use or anything. 
And then we did a lot of side jobs working on cars. So it was really heavy, heavy for on the automotive side. And the cornerstone fundamental things that he had in there, he had a small bench, but it, ha it had a, a metal top on it. So the, if you want a really sturdy, strong bench, go onto Facebook Marketplace and buy some old pallet racking, like the stuff that they use at Home Depot for stacking the lumber on, and bring that home, cut it down with your grinder to bench height, whatever, whatever you want, 32 inch, you want standing height, sitting height, whatever. But, and then put the cross beams in. You can get the cross beams in eights or tens, so that gives you eight foot bench is really nice, pretty, probably minimum. Put the crossbars on, go to your steel place and have them shear you a piece of quarter inch plate steel uh, that just bolts right on, fits right on top of that. One solid, big, heavy piece. That's going to be an immovable bench. That's like I have. I have a 12 footer over here. Ha solid, rock solid. Even without bolting it down, you'd be able to reef on that thing. Put your big vise right on the corner. Vise should always be on the corner never in the middle of a bench, because at the corner you can work at it from the front or the side. The vise is where you're going to spend your time. That's where you do a lot of work. And have, have that there set up. So a good Granddad had a good bench with a good vise on it, and he had a drill press, and he had an air compressor, and he had a toolbox, and he had um, an engine hoist overhead, just a regular chain, chain size. And that was basically it, and we did everything we needed to do and he had a welder he had a stick welder and a bench grinder and wire brush on the bench and that was really that was that was the basics that was the fundamentals a welder a vise a metal bench a toolbox and an air compressor and a, you know the hand tools and stuff so I, that, that's kind of the way I'd look at it so just I can't tell you without knowing your details I would love to be able to spec out your shop for you um, I could definitely do that but um, we would have to, we would have to talk for a long time, and that's not my job to do that. I'm the idea guy. You need to make it happen. But that's cool, man. Shout out to you. That's going to be fun to be able to buy all that new stuff. Buy quality. Buy quality. If you go and you look, oh goodness, a ball door grinder is a thousand nine hundred and seventy dollars. Uh, I don't know if I have that much money, but I want that grinder. Get the ball door. Just go buy it on Facebook Marketplace for two fifty or three hundred. Those things were made the last generations, unlike things today. Shout out to Northlander. We have a super chat from WBLRIE. He's been with us for two months. He says, he, our super chat says, I want a landscaping company and want to get into sprinkler blowouts this fall. Any recommendations on gas compressors trying to avoid trailers? Man, I've never bought a gas compressor. What he's talking about is... Um, blow out sprinklers. Oh, okay. So yeah, I guess, you know, we used to do, I used to do a little bit of that. So we would, uh, not what you're doing, but similar. Uh, when I was doing excavating, we, I used to put in a lot of electrical conduit for subdivision. So it was big stuff. I used to have a heat blanket and stuff for bending it. I did a whole bunch of that stuff. Uh, schedule 80 conduit from one inch up to big stuff, six inch. And what we would do is, so when you put conduit in, it's basically a pipe. Let's say the street's over here, there's power at the power pole, and subdivision or whatever's over here, transformer. You might put in a thousand feet of conduit um, in the preparation that when the power company comes in, that they will pull a line through it. Now, you had the option, you know, we could have had the pole line out of a bucket, and as we're putting each piece in, you know, fishing it through, but that would be foolish. It would take forever to do that. So what we did was we would put in the conduit and then we would go get a big gas air compressor and we would uh, have these, uh, like make a sponge type of thing with an eyelid on it and we would, it would fit tight in the bore. Like imagine like a, a wad going into a musket, kind of not, not tight, but reasonably snug. And then we would tie the string to it, and then we had a little deal where we cap, put a cap over it, and then we injected that, put the air hose on it, and then with copious amounts of air, like a big Ingersoll Rand air compressor, like a tow behind, would blow that through the conduit, 
and it would come out the other side, and that's how we would string it because we had to provide it with the pull rope so that when the power company came in, they could hook onto that and pull their heavy cables or conduit, whatever they pulled through there. So I never had one personally because I didn't have that much use for it, so I always just rented one. So I don't know. I guess if, you, if you're doing sprinkler systems, something probably less. I don't know, man. You know what I would do uh, to find out is if you want to find out who makes the best stuff like that, what I typically do, if I want to know what welder to buy or what air compressor to buy, I think to myself, who's using it every day professionally and who's using it outside? You know, what's, what's going to be built well enough to survive the weather and rain and all that? Go, go talk to your, uh, the service guys that do he work on heavy equipment. That, that drive a service truck. Those guys are going to have that compressor or have a compressor mounted on their service truck that they use daily and that could give you a better recommendation. So that's, what I, that's where I would start. If you want to know what welder to buy, go talk to a welder. Right? You, want to know, you want to know those things. Why reinvent the wheel? You know, those guys know. Guys know tools. They work with them every day. Save you a lot of aggravation. When I was deciding whether to buy a Miller or a Lincoln or a Hobart, I went and talked to guys that are using them. Asked them, what, which one would you buy? Why would you buy? Why the Miller over the Lincoln? Or, you know, you find out, get an education. And usually guys are, are honored when someone, if someone asks their opinion. People like to give their opinions on things. And we men like to talk about the tools that we use and gear and all of that. And I, there's no surprise. So... I found people to be very receptive if you're respectful and don't take up their time. You know, I'm, you know, if you have time, could I ask you a couple questions? I've never been turned down by anyone. We have a super chat from D. Shout out to you, D. D writes, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of vengeance dealt out in those days, isn't there? We just hope that us here, Proho, uh, we, we can... Um, uh, survive the wrath to come. You know, all of us have fallen short. And if uh, it was strictly based upon our deeds and acts and doing the right thing all the time, none of us would be in very good standing if we were to be honest, or very few of us. But thank goodness that God has provided a way so that we don't have to be perfect. He's given us the perfect solution in His Son, Jesus Christ, that all we have to do is claim that. And we... When God looks upon us on that judgment day, it's as simple. He'll be looking not upon our filthy lives and our selfishness and judge, how judgmental we were and lazy we were, but he will look upon the perfect life, life that Christ led and impute that upon us. It's an incredible gift. That's why it's so offensive to those of us who are men of the book, followers of the way, to, to hear people using the Lord's name in vain uh, to for just n not appreciating this gift that has been given to anyone, whosoever will, will accept it, and despised and drug his name, drug in the mud. I mean, the injustice of that, if you stop to think about it, I mean, it just makes you sad, makes you shudder. Can you imagine how you would feel if someone just slighted you, just the slightest thing? Let's say you just gave someone, gave some, someone something of far lesser value than your own son. Gave them a car. How about you give your, how about you give your son a car? You buy him a new car or a, a new used car and um, a very thoughtful gift. And instead of showing appreciation, he doesn't change the oil. He runs it into the ground. He he doesn't never washed it once. Just doesn't give. Doesn't care about it whatsoever. Can you imagine how that would make you feel? Would you be able to ever see him in the same light? Or, or let's say not even a son. Let's say an acquaintance. Let's say you helped out a coworker or your neighbor or buddy that was falling upon hard times, and you made a great sacrifice. Maybe a sacrifice to your family to get him some wheels, something so he could get out, get himself going. You know, get him, get him a head start at your own personal sacrifice. And he blew up the engine because he didn't check the oil or didn't care about it, didn't wash it. Every time you looked at that and looked across the road and saw it getting in worse and worse shape and dirtier and dirtier, your resentment for that man would grow, would it not? It's a true testimony to the, what a 
wonderful and beautiful person our Heavenly Father is, is that in the, in the face of all of that, of all of the people cursing his name and questioning his authority and despising or rejecting the gift that he gave of salvation through the death of his son, how could you do, how could you overlook all of that? You know, and he has been overlooking it for a long time. We just said God is very slow to anger and very long suffering. And he's not willing that any should be lost, that, but that all should become to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved, but he's not going to force you to do it. Yet when you look at it that way, it, does, it puts it in a different perspective. But vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but there will come a time that the door will close. You know, and that time could be tomorrow. For you, you might not wake up tomorrow. If you're putting this off, you know, it might be too late. It's a, it's, a, it's a razor's edge we walk on. We have a super chat, but thank you, D. That was appropriately timed, and that's what we needed to hear right now, wasn't it? What well, it causes me to reflect, that's for sure. Our brother, Spartan219, is in the house. Welcome back. Spartan tells us, can you tell us how to be, how to use boiled linseed oil correctly? Yes. If you have a tool... Let's say you bought a new rake or an axe or a, something that is brand new. Uh, most of the time, it's going to have the, the hateful varnish on it. Now, why do manufacturers put varnish on tool handles? Because it is a terrible thing. It's, it gives blisters. Uh, it's basically like a plastic over the wood. It doesn't uh, give it any is it nu nutrients to the wood. There's nothing you can put in to keep it from shrinking. It's just it's disaster. The only reason that they do it is so it looks pretty in the store. A raw wood handle, when people are handling it, stocking it in the store, transporting it, the oil from your hands, you know, if you get dirty hands, it's going to mar it. It's going to look bad. You can't clean it, wipe it down. It stains it. So it's nothing more than that. So if you have a tool like that, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad tool. It just You have a little bit of work to do. So the first thing you do is put that in the vise. Scrape. Don't sand. Scrape. Scrape the varnish off. If you have it secure, uh, a good sturdy knife or anything that's sharp, that's not, it's got to be substantial. You don't want uh, like a razor blade because it's going to chatter. You need something that's got a good strong blade like a knife and scrape it and scrape all that varnish off. Work it around until it's all gone, until you, until you're down to bare raw wood. Then you're going to get boiled linseed oil, not unboiled. Unboiled linseed oil is a great protectant but it dries very slowly and it will be sticky for a long, long time and remain sticky that way. Boiled linseed oil, which is not typically boiled anymore, there's a drying chemical that's added to it, but it does essentially the same thing, um, dries quicker. So when you get the, the varnish scraped off and you get your wood handle, you put it on once a day for a week, every day for seven days. Put it on a rag, apply it, you know, get it, work, work it in there really good with your hands. And then don't, if it's dripping and you got a lot of excess, wipe, wipe you know, take the rag and, and wipe it off. Don't, you don't want any excess on there because that will dry and, and be all lumpy and stuff. You just, you want it, want it to work it into the wood, let it do its thing, and then wipe off the residual. Do that for seven days in a row. Then you're going to do it once a month. So then every, once a month you're going to do it. Apply the boiled linseed oil. Keep, keep it out of the sun. You use it in the sun, but when you're done, bring it in. And then um, once a month for a year. And then after that, it'll be so saturated and so protected, you'll do it annually, once a year. So just the quick rule of thumb, once a day for a week, once a month for a year, once a year, uh, once a year. Yeah, that's it. Good question. And it will get a beautiful patina, uh, and you will become attached to it, because it'll be something that you've, Something that you've that, that you've made be, made better. We have a new member, Mr. Papa Mac. Welcome. Shout out to you. And our final super chat or member message. Excuse me. Our final final member message from from the Tib Tibby Ronka says, "Hey Cody, I have to thank you for your awesome Bofang video last year. I was looking for two-way radios to use on the property." 
was about to get CB radios when that video came out. Yeah, that's perfect for that. Better than CB radios, in my opinion. It's the, it really is, I mean, they, they're not the best quality, obviously, um, but they're good enough. I mean, I, I don't know if anyone's abused, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone out there that's abused them as more than I have. I've had them, as I said, in every single environment from zero degrees at 10,000 feet snow biking. They've always worked. Not even insulated in the pack with the antenna sticking out. Worked flaw, never not worked. Bad, great battery time. The size, the size is really it for me. The, what really gives me the fizz is the size of it. It's not too big, not too small. It's a great, great size. It's just a pleasing size. The antenna is nice. The interface is easy. They scan, dual band. You can lock them so you don't push buttons when uh, battery time is good. Like when you take the battery out, I mean, the whole back is all metal. It's all, all metal in the back. Good latches. It's got a flashlight. I'd have to say that Profo's, uh, Proho is a fan of the Bofang. I, I think that they're good. I don't like the, I've got the little red ones. I've shared those many times. I've never had a problem with them, but I don't like them near as well as this one. This one I like because of the, uh, the, inter uh, the size of it. I think this, oh, this is the one with the broken battery. Yeah, I did break the, bat the clasp on the battery after many, many years of dropping it in use, but battery still works. This is just one I keep in the shop. My, the other one, I, I replaced the good battery. It's in my pack. But the one I'd recommend one last time is the BF F8HP. That seems to be kind of the go-to one. I'm not the only one that says that. And these are great radios. Okay. Well, goodness. That was a great super chat. A lot of good questions. And, and I, uh, I feel bad about those that that school shooting it's i, I fear we're going there's going to be more of that but you know really it, it it just highlights the importance if we didn't know already and many of us knew a long time ago uh the importance of getting your children out of these institutions man i mean there there's a it's just not it's just not the school that we grew up in and You'd have to be lying to yourself to, to think that what's being taught there is, is going to be better, the best education that you can get for your kids. Um, if you think that that's, you think public school is good, I'll, leave, I'll close with this. And why do the elites and the politicians not have their kids in them? If they have all this virtue, that they're so fond of telling us that the teachers' unions are so fond of telling us that they're uniquely qu uniquely qualified. We spend more money on them than anyone else in the world, and yet we have some of the dumbest students and the most the worst uh, some of the worst um, results. <coughs> if you could see. The brilliance that comes out of the homeschooling groups that I get to see and the involvement of these tradcon mothers and the sacrifices that they make. Just for example, the last debate tournament that I went to had about, uh, that Jack competed in, which he got second place out of 200 kids, which I thought was pretty good, uh, was... Um, there, no, not that, I didn't go to the last one, the one before that. The last one he was at was in Idaho. The one I went to was in Oregon, Washington. Uh, there were 200 kids competing. Now, the majority of these kids that are in debate, this is not a program where you could just dump your kids off and it's a, it's a paid babysitting service. For a child to participate, and children, you know, if anywhere from like, I don't know what the age, probably 12 to 18, for these young people to participate in them, they have to, one of their parents has to be with them. And so therefore the parents are very, very involved with this. So there's, and then the parents are required to do the judging. It's a very, it's a very uh, impressive organization, speech, the speech and debate. Well, the majority 
of these kids in this program are coming from traditional Christian homes, um, conservative with trad con mothers, and, uh, and they homeschool. Not all, but the majority of them. And it is a, the contrast between these children and what you see in the public schools is on, it was, it's like something from another planet. From the modesty of the girls, their dress, to the, the way the young men come and, and, and look you in the eye and know how to shake hands properly. Uh, they, it, this is what children look like that are raised by parents and not raised by the state. If you were to see that, uh, there, I wouldn't need to be speaking on this anymore because it would be self-evident, um, the, the differences. But to be in that environment of, of women and mothers that, that are, are actively involved in their raising their, their sons and daughters and sacrificing for them so they can be the best that they can be, these women understand that they'll, they're accountable, that they have a responsibility, a God-given responsibility to look after these children and to raise them, and to educate them, and to protect them in an evil world. And just all these snapshots, I remember, I remember the first thing I, I noticed is just walking in and a whole table lined with, with hot pots of, of the mothers that were making, you know, making the meals for, for their families. And, there are, there are mothers there that have multiple kids, and they're still doing all of this. And they don't have enough money to go out and to eat out or to go get hamburgers or pizza or anything like that. And so not only are they involved with the education, but they're also providing on the road meals and feeding all of their children. It is, it's an extraordinary thing to see. It's an extraordinary thing to see. There's still hope, but it's, it's less and less. You have to really look, look to find it, and you have to be very deliberate. And there's, uh, yeah, I'm proud of those kids for sure. Mr. Tony Bologna is with us. Fire up the bike. Oh, yes, absolutely. So let me tell you about that. Uh, so yesterday I came out. So if you don't know, so... I did a live stream for the, mem well, it wasn't really a live stream. It was kind of a shop hangout. It went for hours and hours. I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to the guys too much because I was wanting to focus. I rebuilt the top end on my, on my Husqvarna 300, put a new piston in it. And uh, I was unable to finish it. I got the bike all buttoned up. It was ready to start. And then I had to end the live stream because we had game night with our friends across the road. Yesterday morning, I came out before breakfast, put the gas tank on, Touched the starter, it started up perfectly, much better uh, than it did before. And then, not only that, so I got it started, I'm like, oh, good. I can, I went before breakfast, went and had my breakfast afterwards, and I was very relieved that it actually ran and started, but will it blow up? Uh, and then um, Brian, my neighbor Brian came over with his, he's got an XR250, and he had a couple things to fix. So we fixed, wrenched on his bike a little bit, I finished, buttoned mine up, and then we, a gunshot? I heard uh, we got on the road and did about a 60-mile 60 60 mile loop uh, on the road. And goodness, it was cold. 43 degrees at six and 60 miles, uh, we were pretty cold. Uh, but it ran perfectly and tremendous, a lot more compression, a lot more horsepower, nice, crisp, tight, like it used to be when it was brand new. It's perfect. So six, 60 miles on it, uh, rung it out really hard. Um, broke it in nice, uh, seems to be perfect. So I guess I put it together right. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Shout out to you, Tony. It was good to see you on the, the members uh, chat the other day too. And finally, we have our friend Xavier Goslin. Shout out to you, Xavier. Welcome. Xavier writes, hey, hi, Cody. How do you like the Nitto the Nito tires on the F-350? Are they better than the KO2? That's a hard thing to quantify. Now, I did not want the Nitos. I wanted the KO2s. Uh, KO2, the BFG KO2s are my favorite tire. I think I like the look of them, you know, the look and the performance. You know, and they're a snowflake tire, and they perform exceedingly well. I don't know if it's just the particular 
rubber compound that works well in the Pacific Northwest, but I've had them forever and they're just excellent tires and they look great too. So it's a, it's a win-win for me because we're, we're all about the fizz around here, right? You don't want to put ugly tires on, on your, dual, your truck with dual alternators. You don't want to bring the thing down, right? So I, my tire guy, I said, I want KO2s and what I want is I want to run the factory rims I'm not a Philistine. I'm not going to take good factory wheels off and put low quality wheels on and pay for the experience that just date and look terrible anyway in five years. And I don't want, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a child. I don't want big wide and I don't want to just destroy. I want performance. I don't want just something big to look good and then behave horribly on the road. So my criteria was I want Trophy truck type suspension. What I wanted to build was a, basically a, a Ford Raptor, but they don't offer the Raptor in a, in a Super Duty, so it's, it's a Super Duty Raptor. That was what I was going for. So suspension was important to me, but I wanted the tires to have the look, you know, the, the right look with because I've got King suspension on it and not lifted the front up about three, four inches. But I wanted to use the factory wheels and I wanted the offset, I wanted to keep everything inside the wheel wells. I don't want stick tires sticking out, throwing mud and all the non, all that nonsense, right? They don't make a tire, KO2 doesn't make a tire to meet that criteria, uh, to use the factory rims. I could have put KO2s on, but it would have meant going aftermarket rims, and I didn't want to do that. So he said, KO2 doesn't do it, but Nitto does. And he said, Nitto's a better tire. So the KO2 is an all-terrain where the Nitto is... And I might be speaking out of place here. I'm not the tire guy, but for how I understood it was the Nitto was kind of a hybrid between a mud terrain and a all terrain. So a, a nice mix. So you get the aggressive look of it um, and, and such. So after having them, I've got 30,000 miles on them. Um, the wear is similar to the KO2. The performance, I would say, on snow and ice is not as good not as good. I don't remember ever winching myself out of so many lo so winching myself out near as much with the KO2s as I have with the Nittos. But I've also had a lot of weight on it. I've used them to pull uh, the big the dump trailer with the excavators. I've used them, I've had them with the camper which is actually over, too heavy um, for, for a single axle truck and they've been fine with that. Um, so it, they've, everything's been perfectly fine. And, and this, the idea that they're not as good as the KO2 on the snow and ice is, is simply my think so. And this probably has no truth whatsoever. It's probably just my, my bias and my think so. But if we're going to get down to the important things, which is every day I walk by it and I look at it and I look at those tires, what, how do, does it make me feel? What do I think? Regardless of just, just going to the pure emotion side of it. And, you know, that's not to be underrated with, with us, gentlemen. You know, I mean, you, you understand our connection as men, especially American men, with our trucks, right? It's an important thing. It's not to be underlooked. So how it makes you feel and, you know, how it gives you the fizz or doesn't give you the fizz is important. When I walk by it, I, it, I can think, just today, this happened. Right before I came in there, I walk by and I look at it, I look at the tread, and I think one thing... Well, the one thing that I think in my mind is, I wish I had KO2s. <laughs> Does that help? <laughs> and I have no reason, no reason to think about it, but I think what it comes down to is they don't look as cool. I never have really liked the look of them. I, I just, they just don't look as good. They, they just don't look as good. But I'm a complete homer for the KO2s. I, 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 I like them. I know, I used to, my tire guy. I put them on everything. I have them on the on the adventure van. I got a tire guy uh, about four, 30 minutes or here, here for just a small guy that started in his garage and, and a, a Hispanic guy that I just I just think the world of. So I, I give him all the business I can. I get all my tires from him. But he you know, he's Hispanic. So he's he's all about getting guys a good deal. So he he knows tires. And he lives with them on a daily basis. And, and so, you know, when old boomers come in with their, with their uh, like me, with their preconceived notions and their and inflexible, have to have what you have to have. And he always tries to gently steer. He's like, you know, 
I can get you the same thing uh, for you know significant savings. You know you don't need the bu you know you're paying for the name or he'll say things like that. And I just stop him and I just say Paco. I know. Just order the KOTs. That's what I want. All right. All right, SA. All right. I order them for you. I get them. So he doesn't bother me anymore. I, I call him, and he just knows uh, that um, he's not going to talk me out of them. But I had no choice. I, I, was, they ha I was over a barrel. If I wanted to use my factory rims, they did not have uh, – I don't want any rubbing. Yeah, I don't want any – I mean, I'm, I've done all that in the past. You know, I, I used to be a fool uh, and do body lifts and all of that. And it was all about show and no go. Not, not anymore. No, I put my money – I put my money where it matters. Coil over suspension, locking differentials, good ones, Yukon gear sets, um, and good quality stuff that performs. I, I don't cut any corners anymore. No more – no more half-ass. Um, I do things right. And that's what's really cool. I mean, when you, like the truck, like when I did, like the truck, I like the stance of it. It's all personal. You know, you, your, your mileage may vary to, as nothing fancy always says. But I think, I think the truck is cool because I have no lift kit on it. But the factory Ford trucks come with a little bit of a slope on the front. You know, they're kind of nose down, like a bird dog, as my granddad used to say. And I don't like that. So I like the look of it. If you look at a trophy truck, a trophy truck is, is proud up at the top. You know, it sits up, up high. You know, e usually the front end, because the travel's so great on them, the front end is actually even a little taller. It has that, 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 that look like that. That's what I wanted. So I had, when, I, when we were uh, d or specking out the coilovers, you know, we kind of compensated for that. So I had maximum suspension on that, you know, lots of suspension. So the suspension, the King coilovers are so good that if you've ever been on like really washboardy gravel, if you've ever been on that washboardy gravel roads where you, you hit it in your whole truck, I mean, like stuff's flying off the dash and I mean, it just jars your teeth out. There's nothing you can do. It's dangerous. You can't even get traction. With this truck, with those king coilovers on it, you can just blast through that 40, 50, 60 miles an hour and just no nothing, man. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's expensive suspension, but it's very, very good. And we sized it. We got it. We got it. Everything just right where I, I maximize where I use up all of the suspension. Now, I'm not racing it, obviously, but I'm, you know, I'm, I get in some, a lot of really bad roads and, and gnarly stuff uh, when we go out of town snow biking, and I'm pulling that trailer. So we're pulling that trailer, and sometimes, you know, we get to a lot of stuff where there's big hill climb, and I'm like, okay, second gear, lock up all differentials and hammer down and just go for it, and they get one chance at it, and that suspension that makes a big difference uh, with getting over that stuff. And I... Every once in a while, it'll bottom. I, I'll fill it bottom out, and I, I like that. I don't want to be bottoming out all the time, but when you hit something really gnarly with, with weight on it and you feel that bottom out, that's a good sign because you know you're using it all up. You know, you're using all of that, that nice, supple, beautiful suspension. We have, oh, we have one last super chat from Zippy the Unicorn. Shout out to you, Zippy. Zippy writes, consider becoming Catholic. No, no, no. I, we, Proho can't be Catholic. He's, he's Protestant. Um, no, Catholic is not the way. The, the Catholic Church is, I have nothing against the Catholic people. I have a lot of, a lot of, some of my closest friends are lifelong devout Catholics. But the system, the Catholic Church is corrupt. And, and um, I can't get behind that. So, no. Nothing against you, Zippy. Uh, God has his people everywhere. But at this day and age, with the knowledge that we have now, uh, the Catholic Church is not the answer, in my opinion. We have one last super chat from Huskers. Shout out to you, Huskers. And he writes, I've considered uh, from KO2s to Cooper Discovery, AT3s, XLTs, and never looked back. Used to be a KO2 believer, and these things have changed my mind. You know, you're not the first person that I've heard of. When I talk to tire guys that are in the industry, they always are always talking about how good Coopers are. But Coopers are not cool. And so I just can't get behind that. Am I, you know, I, I can't put Cooper on, man. 
It's just, you know, it just comes down to the, th Coopers don't give me the fizz. I don't care. This is the petulant child coming out of me. I don't care if I got 25% uh, more mileage on a Cooper tire. I couldn't do it because it just doesn't, it just doesn't give me the fizz. I knew a guy, Cooper, I didn't like, and he ruined the name for me. So I can't get with the Coopers. But I heard they're the best. <laughs> so you're probably right. You know, we'd, we'll just close with this. You, you, like, you like what you like, and you can't account for taste. And uh, we here, uh, Proho does not judge a man um, if you do it because it just it gives you the fizz. That, that is always the, that always trumps everything. Um, and I'm stealing that from Nut and Fancy, so shout out to Nut and Fancy. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for watching. May God bless you and your families. Please keep us in your prayers. Sorry we started late today. I had uh, an un unexpected visitor that needed something, and, uh, well, we had a we had to get the cow out of the hole, so or out of the well. So uh, st we started a little bit late, but everything turned out all right. Thank you, beloved. May God bless you and your families. Keep us in your prayers, and we'll see you, Lord willing, on tomorrow's live stream.